We spared no expense on three sides of whatever the fuck this show's called. This week, three sides of the coin. I love sex and rock and roll. It's my life. Ready to rock. Bump and grind. Legends never die. Ain't none of your business. Wendy O. Williams and the Wow album. We it's go- the greatest kiss album without a logo on it. The greatest kiss album without a kiss logo. As compared to Carnival of Souls, which is the worst kiss album with a kiss logo. <laughs> But I love hate, man. That song's awesome. Shut up, Mark. Helping out. Yeah. Oh, and we find and we ask the big question. Did Vinnie Vincent save Wendy O. Williams? This is Three Sides of the Coin. Talking all things KISS. I wanna rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Robert, one of three sides, 13 men, here with Uncle Gene, who has a message for Mike. Brad Vold, you're a tool. Both the best, and you got it. Here's your three sides of the coin kiss cast for this week. The 20th Indie Kiss Expo is in the books. Fans were treated to Q&As as well as performances, including the much-anticipated Freely's Comet reunion, and a historic set featuring the Kulik brothers, Eric Singer, and Ace sharing the stage for the first time. Gene threw out the ceremonial first pitch in Chicago before a game between the Cubs and the White Sox last week. Gene was in town for another Vault Experience event and stopped by Wrigley Field to do the honors. And this week in Kissery, Unmasked was released on May 20th, 1980. The album reached number 35 on the Billboard charts and earned gold status in the U.S., while singles Andy and Talk To Me saw success overseas. That's all for this week. See you next time on Three Sides of the Coin, KissCast. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I am one of your two co-hosts, Michael Branville, pretty much always joined by Tommy Summers. Mm-hmm. And I'm sad to say, at some point during the show, you'll see Mark Cicchini show up, but he shows up and he leaves. He, mm-hmm. We've got to really deal with nailing down this guy's contract. He just comes on the show when he wants and he leaves when food's delivered. It's impossible to schedule anything. Yeah, he's probably eating. He's probably eating half a cow right now. Which half? That's your homework I, question. Does he start at the front or the back? Knowing Mark, the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, we are so bad. Yeah, well, we are so bad. Do, but, um, know, he... I was gonna, I was gonna plug our contest, but a contest. By the time this airs, the contest is over. This will be so. over. Yeah, we we've done that. It's if you guys don't know it by now, you could have won. You could have won one of these autographed Vinnie Vincent eight by ten photos. But by the time you're watching this, we have it's over. We've, we've given, given them, them away. away. I but, hope you. But also, I hope you entered. But let's say a big thank you to everybody that did enter, because we had, how many entries did we have? Well, as of this recording, there's over 1,300 entries. Wow. That's insane. I would bet by the time it closes on the 15th, over 1,500, <laughs> maybe we can push it to 2,000 entries. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's possible. So a huge shout-out to Randy and Vinny Vincent for providing us with the photos and autographing them. Thank you very much. Very generous. Yep. And congrats to whoever the three winners were. So, Tommy, any comments you want to read? Yeah, actually, I would like to. Uh, the one I wanted to read was 
Tom Tobin's and I just can't seem because we've got we've got so many freaking links to this show it's hard to stay on top of it so I'm going to just Oh is that the one from here. Spreaker? Oh is it Spreaker? Yeah. The one I shared okay. with you and Mark on Yes, chat? that's brilliant. Yes. Basically well, well I like I said I don't know where it is. It well here let me let it. me find it. I I sent it to you on chat. Just go into well, our that chat. That doesn't mean anything. Um Okay. Here we go. Comment from Tom Tobin. One thing that I got to love about Three Sides of the Coin is that they can take a single song and create an entire podcast around it. As lousy of a song that it is, these guys know how to pimp it. Got to love the Three Sides boys. <laughs> He's talking about the episode, last week's episode, where we reviewed Special Ace episode Fraley's and Bronx reviewed it. Yeah, we reviewed Ace Fraley Bronx Boy. Now, yeah. he said it's a lousy song. I didn't. I just didn't like the vocals. Okay. okay. Uh, there you go. So but yeah, we 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 work our magic. We do. We can we, we can do. turn it we can turn a turd in a punch bowl into a diamond. Yes, we can. Just takes time. And I'm not saying that Ace Fraley's song is a turd in a punch bowl. Okay? No, he is not. He's not, so keep the hate mail going elsewhere. <laughs> so um, before we get started, I wanted to tell you guys all about my Gene Simmons experience uh, with the Gene Simmons band last week at the Surf Ballroom. If you are a Kiss fan, which I'm sure you are, you, why, why would you listen to us? Well, maybe they're you, just a fan of me. Like I said, if you weren't... <laughs> A Kiss fan, why would you listen to us? You have to go. I am telling you, it was one of the coolest shows I have seen. The set list will blow your mind. Uh, the, the highlights for me was Charisma, which we kind of knew he would do. He did I, and he did A World Without Heroes, and he did She's So European. He also did, you know, um, a Fits bunch like of other stuff. It's like a glove. Stuff. It's like a glove. And in... It, it, seriously, it was amazing, and it just they one right after the other. And got to give credit to the guys in the band; they are unbelievable musicians. I could not get over how freaking good they were. I mean, these songs sound better than the recordings, and uh, all of them can sing. Every single one of them, Phil, Jeremy, uh, they all, all of them can sing. And so they would trade off leads. And guitar parts and they trade off some of the vocals and then gene would sing it was just it was really a great experience and i can't wait to go see him again so get out there and support them but the odd thing was there was no merchandise that's at all for, for sale for, for gene that's really odd i there was a lot of people complaining they're like i wanted to buy a t-shirt there weren't any which i'm like gene okay not... someone gene, got fired gene, over hey, that one hey I think. boss hey boss yeah Merchandise? You give us crap? Yeah. Merchandise? And I went I went there with Kyle, my buddy Kyle, and the last song, Gene's like, all right, we're, I, want, I want 50 people up on stage to do this last song. Rock and roll all night? Yeah. And so he was picking these different people out, and, and Kyle's like, dude, let's go, dude, let's go. I'm like, all right. So we walked up to the front and the side, and Jeremy saw us over there, and he motioned to the security guards. He said, you know, let those two guys up. So we got up on stage right as the song was starting, and Gene had no idea that we were on there. And he keeps seeing us at these different things. And for those of you that haven't seen this, I highly recommend it because the, the, you'll get this whole thing. I posted a video of this experience doing the Rock and Roll Night, and we were like – passing back and forth between each other. We were, you know, filming the crowd and filming the band and all that sort of thing. And then about three quarters of the way through the song, I'm standing like this filming Gene. And he's smiling and he's playing. He looks over at me. He's like... And that sums up my experience. Like, <laughs> like where did you come from and why are you here you freaking tool get off my stage that's about it well no he told me to get off his well actually he didn't tell me to get off his bus you were wearing your brandville as a tool t-shirt i was wearing my brandville as a tool t-shirt so we were we were there right after soundcheck and we were up there earlier in the day 
And so we were in with Ryan looking at all the memorabilia. And that's another thing, too. Any of you guys that live anywhere in remotely near uh, Clear Lake, Iowa, which is uh, they have the surf ballroom. That was the last place that Buddy Holly died, you know, played and had died there. So the memorabilia and the history of music is just unbelievable. They've got photos of all the acts that have played there practically going all the way back to Guy Lombardo and, and uh, Lawrence Welk. Just really cool history there. And so uh, Ryan had to take off to take care of some promoter stuff. And, and Kyle and I were like, oh, we're just going to go get a bite to eat. <laughs> and so we're looking for a couple people that we went with, uh, Mark and, and Lena. And I said, well, you know, they're probably still sitting on the bus talking to them. So let's at least let them know we're going to go have a bite since, you know, they rode with us. And we uh, have all their stuff in my car. So I just I go up onto the bus and there's Gene sitting there. And it's Gene and the two of them. And then I think it was, I don't remember if it was Jeremy. And anyways, and he looks at me, he's like, who are you and why are you on my bus? <laughs> and then I come in a little bit closer and then he sees me and I'm like, oh, hey, I'm Tommy. And he's like, Brian Bold is a tool. No comment. <laughs> and then it turned into like just this two minute thing of just total like uncomfortableness. Because I said, well, we're just here to tell them we're going to go have a bite to eat. And if they want to join us, they're welcome to. And he's like, well, are you going to go or are you going to stay? I mean, because you can stay if you would like, but you can certainly go if you want to. And this went on literally for two minutes without anybody saying anything at all. And then it was like, okay. You know, so then later that night when he sees us up on stage, he's just like. And so this weekend, by the time this airs, it'll be done. But Kyle's going to the the uh, Gene Simmons fault experience with a buddy of his, and he's going to wear a three sides t-shirt. So, Gene's going to go. <laughs> exactly. It's going to be great. Yeah. I'm like, film it. So for those of you that are wondering, that's kind of the life. I, I wish, I wish us. Gene would do some shows out here in Northern California. He hasn't had any out here anywhere near us. So I would definitely yeah. go see it. I am really excited to see that just yesterday, Yes. The lovely and talented Ace Fraley announced two shows out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Which is August awesome. August so 5th go. in Petaluma and August 6th in Berkeley. So I've got two shows I can finally go see Ace Fraley. I mean, he hasn't played out here in, in San Francisco proper. I want to say it was like 2009 or something like that. It's been a long time since he played SF. Well, yeah, he hasn't been in San, he hasn't been in Minneapolis since 2005. But I'm going to see him probably three or four times this summer because he's playing within a hundred miles or so in different different locations. So he, but seriously, all kidding aside and stuff, you know, Gene gets it. He understands the bit, and I, he's got a very dry sense of humor. And I think he just likes to bust balls. That's what I think. I don't know. Maybe he hates me, but go, go and see him. Uh, and all the guys are like, you know, we had Ryan on a couple of weeks ago. They're all so super nice and cool and very approachable. So make sure you talk to them if you see them, because they will totally get into this kiss talk with you. And, yeah, and tell, it's tell, just them, a tell them you're experience. a three sides listener. That'll break the ice. Absolutely. There you go. If you don't know what to say to them, tell them you're a three sides listener and that will break the ice. And they are seriously, they're so cool. Such nice guys and just incredible, incredible musicians. Those songs are flawless, really. And when he broke into fits like a glove and some of this, because we're like, I don't want to see the set list. I don't want to know. So it was just such a treat to not know what was coming next. I knew they were going to open up with Deuce and I knew they were going to end with Rock and Roll Night. But other than that, I had no idea in the middle what was coming. It was really cool. Plus, he did a couple songs from his box set, but I didn't know those because I haven't heard the box set yet. But nonetheless, or the vault, um, it was great. A lot cool. of fun. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So let's uh, let's intro our special guest this week, and um, the topic du jour is going to be all about this lovely lady and her solo album, Wendy O. Williams' The Wow Album from 1984. Mm -hmm. We are joined by Ron Albanese who is a huge KISS fan, huge Cheap Trick fan, huge music fan, really knows his stuff about this. And we have a awesomely fun discussion, track by track, talking about this album as KISS fans who were there. You know, that was the cool thing. We were all there in 1984 when this came out. What it was like to, to, to find this album, to listen to it. Um, 
this this is this is what you love three sides for. This is Kiss Talk, deep Kiss Talk amongst Kiss fans. Mm-hmm. So stick around and watch this. He fits right in. He fits right he's in. He's a knucklehead. He's a knucklehead just he's like a, the he's rest a knucklehead, of us. and and unfortunately, at some point, Mark does show up. Yeah, kind of so derails takes, the conversation. Takes a turn. Derails the conversation a little bit because he wants to get himself everything about him, but deal with it. Mm-hmm. You know, otherwise, Ron Albanese. We're talking about Wendy o. Williams. The Wow Album, 1984. Let it roll. Hey everybody, I want to welcome our special guest. Everybody who's not one of the knuckleheads is a special guest, is basically the way it works around here. Pretty much. Um, that, so that means Lisa's, Lisa's not technically a knucklehead. So she's no, always a special not. guest. Special. Um, I want to welcome a special guest, Ron Albanese, to the show. Ron <laughs> goes way back. I mean, I remember like the AOL Kiss days, right? I mean, absolutely. Were you around on the um, news groups and stuff like that? Yeah, I was uh, back in college. Uh, you know, leading into the the reunion, uh, I was on the black and white uh, message boards at yep. college, and then of course this little website called Kiss Otaku uh, kept me informed after that. Yeah, so so Ron's a veteran. A veteran of the Kiss Online world. That's right. Um, but well, so so there's so much we want to talk about. Let let's start a little bit yeah. with um, your fandom, and and I want to make sure you touch on the fact you're an absolute huge Cheap Trick fan. Absolutely. So that'll make Tommy happy. That will at least yeah, get Tommy dude. interested. Yeah. How can Tommy, you not be a Cheap? Tommy trick. doesn't really enjoy talking about Kiss. Apparently not. Um, Let so me tell you, told. I was just blasting one on one in the car, and oh, I'm like, "Oh my god, god what I a great record. record!" Why didn't that yes. album do better? That is like such. It, it's it it deserves so much more recognition. It really does. You know it, what you could say is, uh, "All right, it lacks Tom Peterson." Okay, uh, the drumming is very much of its time. You know they were trying something different going into the '80s. Uh, but it more than makes up for it with Robin and Rick, uh, the songwriting. No Tom, and, and... no bunny, no problem. <laughs> well, you said that. I didn't <laughs> say that. But uh, Robin Zander, MVP of that record. Absolutely incredible. I agree. It, it's just it well, just had all of the classic cheap trick quirkiness, wackiness. Yeah, it had a good hard rock edge to it. It had good anthem songs to it. Um, I just loved everything about that album. Yeah, you know, I, when that album came out, I would read Billboard religiously, and I'd watch it going up, small increments up to Hot 100, and I'd be like, come on, get up there, get up there. And then it just died like at 42 or something, and I was like, ah, all right. That is kind of the album where things just died for Cheap Trick, because I remember going to that, yeah. that tour. They were headlining an arena tour, and yep. I was yep. like, shit. The arena's empty. Yeah. And, and I think I think it's hangover from the record before when Peterson kind of left and then they had to sue their record label for lack of promotion. And I think they just got shelved at that point. So it wouldn't have mattered what that record was. It wouldn't have won. Yeah, they lost momentum internally. And then the whole scene, you know, when you think about all those bands that went from being platinum at the end of the 70s to yeah. barely hitting gold in the early 80s, they were one of them, probably the biggest one. Tone, leave that light on for me. My wife just shut the light. <laughs> that was that Last was Tom call. Peterson. He shut the lights. Last <laughs> call. She brought me some espresso. So yeah, the cheap trick <laughs> gods are punishing you. Yes, yes. But you're right. You know, listen. A lot of those bands and that album was totally underappreciated. Uh, She's you're talking about tight two... is just such a brilliant single. And in what well, world? My love. Exactly. And I, I don't want your love. But I let me tell you something. That went to three in Australia. It should have went to one here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely a great song. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, Cheap Trick is one of those bands where it depends on the day of the week, whether they're, they're my number one or number two favorite band. It's either Cheap Trick or Kiss. I got to tell you, I think most of the time it always ends up being Cheap Trick. <laughs> yeah, there's... So- there's different reasons why you love each one, but I, I go back and forth too, Mike. Absolutely. It's, it's very much your mood and everything else, but 
I, I, I don't know. I think over the span of Cheap Trick's career, there's more Cheap Trick albums that I feel like are what I would say Cheap Trick albums, where Kiss has had albums where you're like, what the hell is this? It's not Kiss. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. <laughs> well, yeah, they didn't produce a Crazy Nights or an Elder. The closest yeah. you get to that is the Doctor, and that's there's still some good songs on that record. Uh, wow. they, they should, you know, they could have done a Crazy Nights that might have saved their career. Uh, they did. It was it called was Lap World. of Luxury. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. But you know what? You mentioned the Doctor, and I, I got to tell you, when I did a fanzine for Cheap Trick, I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, my friend Mike Casal and I in the 90s did a paid fanzine uh, called One on Four. And I say paid because we ended up having subscribers in about 11 countries um, and sending us out. This was just as the Internet was breaking. And uh, the guys in the band found out about it, loved it. Uh, we got a great voicemail from Rick Nielsen right away thanking us. And we were ecstatic. And what I used to do with those guys was always tease them. We were going to do an all-doctor issue. And um, I, I believe, Tommy, you just said you said you like the record. I think in a lot of ways it's Rick Nielsen's last stand as a songwriter. Uh, the quirkiness is there, the wit. And I know it's, yeah. it's wrapped in an 80 shell of production and everything. Um, but I'll take it any day over a lot of the later records even. Oh, like Special One is their worst record. Oh, I think, yeah. Far that, and that away. Was a, that it's was just a it's unlistable. One. That was a tough um, album. Yeah, that's their Carnival of Souls for me. You know, yep. uh, I, I just can't get into it. I try revisit it every couple of years, Spotify, or I even bought the cool uh, vinyl. Just just can't do it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. thought I thought Rock Rockford was a good um, attempt at coming back to what was classic Cheap Trick. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It has the humor there, yes. too. Um, it's not like we're back and we're mad, you know, like the self-titled album, which we all probably dig. Uh, has a little bit of darkness to it, and 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 it, it had to be made at that point. But I needed the wit. I needed that again. Yeah, and that's... Rockford really, um, that's a great later day effort from any band. You know yes. that really stands up. Yep. Yeah, and to me, the last two are by far the best they've done in forever. I love both of them. Interesting. Where do you stand on uh, the old stuff? What's your favorite album of all time? Cheap Trick. Dream Police. Wow. Okay. Um. God, I would say the '97 album, oh, or maybe, or maybe wow. "Standing on the Edge." Great call on "Standing on the yeah. Edge." Yeah, I just am not Great a fan call. of the first record, and everyone that's their favorite. And for me, it's like I like the songs, but I like they. To me, they suffer the same way that "Kiss Alive" does. I like "Kiss Alive" much better than any of those studio versions of those songs. Yeah. So I, you know. I just the last two records to me are two of the best they've ever done, and I would say the same thing about Motley Crue when they put out uh, the last couple. I'm just like, wow, these are they just keep getting better. You know, I I, I will I will never diss <clears throat> the the first couple Cheap Trick albums, but again, as Mark loves to say, timeline is so important, and I was yeah. not a Cheap Trick fan until the Dream Police Budokan era. So that's when I that right. that's when I me dropped too. into yeah. Cheap Cheap Trick. It's like I dropped into Kiss, Destroyer Alive too, so th yeah. I those early albums I wasn't there. They had no impact on me. So Dream Police to me is just a phenomenal album. Budokan, without question, the best live album by anybody anywhere ever. I love, love, love Budokan. Um, yeah, you know, <clears throat> Standing on the Edge was one of those. I remember when it came out, I could not wrap my head around that i hated it oh, really hated it i was just like this is just too freaking strange even for cheap <laughs> trick it was too strange but now i go back and it's like man that is a phenomenal album i, I look at that now and i go i totally love it so it, it's yeah. grown on me um one on one right up there but yeah then then during the the 80s and stuff it was just like shooting shit against a wall you didn't know what was coming out it was one of those you're my band yeah. i'm going to support you but god knows what i'm going to hear when the fucking needle drops on this album right speaking speaking of the busted record uh, <laughs> i <think> i just <laughs> that's the record for me that is uh too much of something and not enough of nothing uh yeah. but you said something about the first record mike you know what it might be tommy like with that one it's like uh too much clay you know a band starts whittling away 
and finding their sound and style, that maybe had a little too much. And then when you get into In Color, Heaven Tonight, and Dream Police, to me, they're almost like one big record. You yeah. know, stylistically, yep. it's there. Production is, is you know, in the same neighborhood. And then, of course, at Budokan. I have to ask you, Mike, have you heard, I think I posted this when you talked about live albums recently online. Have you heard Roller World by the Bay City Rollers? Mm -mm. This is interesting. It came out about 2006. It was recorded at the Budokan uh, during uh, like a 77 tour. And the funniest thing is it sounds a lot like at Budokan by Cheap Trick. Uh, the drums, the audience, the sound of the hall. You have to check it out. I'll check it out. Yeah, 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 it's pretty cool. Yeah. So anyway, before we've lost all of our 12 listeners because they thought this was going to be a KISS show, let's go back and start talking a little bit. About how crappy kit. your shirt is? My shirt? Oh. Yeah. Dude, no, not that. you, Ron. Look, look at, at that. that. I just got my the, brand new KISS lyric shirt. Who the fuck wears something like that? That's awful. I just got my new KISS <sighs> lyric shirt, Crazy Crazy Nights. I love wow. it. As soon as I yeah. saw it, I'm like, fuck yes. Then they, they actually even did a Crazy Nights lyric. And I saw, I looked at him like, what asshole would buy this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, if that shirt's <laughs> if that shirt's at Asylum, I'd wear it. But I can go. pretty and much probably... guarantee you, I probably was the very first person on Amazon to buy this. Yeah, you You're got the a guy. Go. You're the guy. <laughs> I'm I'm probably the only person who's bought it so far. Right. <laughs> um. So anyway, today, today we're gonna talk. Ron, Ron, I don't know, might be considered a self-proclaimed um expert on this album one way we could approach it we're going to talk about an album that first of all every kiss fan has to own should own you should mm -hmm. own it you got to at least go listen to it should go own it because it is without question the best kiss album without the kiss logo on it no questions asked i think everybody can agree oh, yeah. with that oh yeah this, Absolutely. This, this is a Kiss album with a female lead vocalist and no Kiss logo. We're talking about Wendy O. Williams' Wow album. And this came out 1984. So put yourself in the Wayback Machine. Go back to 1984 where Kiss was. And uh, Wendy O. Williams was just, this was post-plasmatics. And uh, I remember... So I, my first KISS show was Creatures of the Night, Plasmatics Open. And mm -hmm. back wow. then, everybody was aware of the Plasmatics. You, it was, it's sort of like KISS. You, you knew who they were. You may not have an opinion on their music, but you knew of the band. I was yes. not a Plasmatics fan. It was too punk for me. I was not, I was not into the Plasmatics. The visuals and everything else, great. I You know, blowing up buses and whipped cream and chainsaws and everything. great i love it but the music just did absolutely nothing for me and i remember when this came out i was like you know is this just gonna be you know a punk rock album and uh you know at the time let's just let me just read what was what was publicly released because remember 84 pr way pre-internet so there's not you know rumors and we know this and we know that you basically get the information from the back of an album cover or a press release or anything like that so it's wendy o williams lead vocals west beach rhythm guitar michael ray lead guitar reginald van helsing bass guitar hmm. you're like oh, okay i don't know there's some bass player reginald van helsing tc tolliver drums special guest ace fraley lead guitar Paul mm -hmm. Stanley, Eric Carr, Mitch Weissman, Mickey Free, and backing vocals, The Boys, and produced by Gene Simmons. So right there, as a KISS fan, all right, I'm buying it. Because I'm oh, sure, right. you know, like all of us back then, if it had a KISS name on this, you bought it. It didn't fucking matter who the band was. You yeah. bought it yeah. because it's produced by Gene Simmons and it's got everybody else on here. I could care less what it was going to sound like, but I got to tell you, when I played it, shit, what a phenomenal album! It was not punk rock. Wendy no, Williams, it was totally Plasmatics, different. totally different. Which I suspect, and you can probably talk more to this, Ron. 
it did not sit well with Wendy O. Williams fans. I'm sure they were probably like, what the fuck is this commercial sounding stuff? Well, well that's the thing. You know, it, it's funny, and you kind of touched on this. I've yet to meet a Plasmatics or Wendy O. Williams fan, you know? Uh Every group seems to have a little cult audience, you know, even if you know if they were a small band. But you really don't hear much, uh, you know, or see somebody say, I am a massive Plasmatics fan. And I always wanted to know exactly what they would have thought of this rebranding that Wendy Williams was doing at this point. It, w- it would have been interesting because I, I suspect, and again, I did a little research here when it pulled up the wiki page, and, yeah. and it talked about... Um, the reception of the album was heavily mixed and remains so to this day. Fans received it with a fairly negative response because it was seen as a departure from her sound from the plasmatics and more akin mm-hmm. to that of a Kiss album, which is exactly what it was. Yeah. It was yeah. a very commercial sounding album when you compare it to anything the plasmatics had done prior. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's fascinating, too, because if you look at the career of the Plasmatics and where Kiss was at during the same time period, Kiss really were pretty much in the States, definitely in the Dark Ages, from the release (laughs) of the I Was Made single, you know, uh, all the way through the Creatures Tour. And I think that Creatures Tour uh, found the Plasmatics in the exact same situation. You know, we're going to be raw. We're going to do our best to be the best Plasmatics we can be. Kiss is going to try to be the best Kiss they can be, um, the Kiss that everybody knows. And it didn't work for either band. So what you had, of course, is Kiss veering off and basically rebranding with the Lick It Up movement. Uh, and then Wendy O going solo. So it really, there is a parallel there of sorts. Yeah, it's almost like the shock value ran its course for both bands. Yeah. yeah. You know, the the American music scene was like, great. You know, that first time we saw the shock, that was pretty interesting. But years later, it's like, okay, yeah, the shock is wore off. Yeah, they, the they just weren't buying it, you know. And the plasmatics were really living on borrowed time because their shtick was much smaller. And, you know, unless you were, it, see, it almost seemed like to me a lot of the people that I knew that were fans of punk music didn't really like them. You know, and the metal people yeah. didn't. They had a very, like to Ron's point, a very small niche group of people that actually followed them. Yeah, the, the only national attention they, they got before the Kiss tour, I believe, would be doing Tom the Snyder. Tom Snyder show. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. That's it. And Yeah, and that was essentially it. Hey, we, we saw cars and blow them up. And Fridays. They are on Fridays, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and both of those were, you know, the same, uh, the same idea. I, I, I can yeah. tell you, as a, as a Kiss fan, I was, it, it didn't matter who was opening the Kiss concert. Let's be frank about that. I could have given a shit. But right. if I had my choice, it wouldn't have been the Plasmatics. That's not who I would. I would have rather. I would have rather had Night Ranger open than the Plasmatics as a Kiss fan. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, let me ask you. I, I've always been uh, curious about this. What did the Plasmatics get stage size wise, volume wise, show wise? Were they allocated? You know, most of their regular deal. Yeah, for the most part, um, yeah. you know, and then they they blew up and she smashed some TVs and then she cut the Les Paul in half, um, and we were throwing ping pong balls at her. <laughs> you aren't having it. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you do, are you a Wendy Williams fan? Uh, no. Well, not so much that I know about ping pong balls. Okay, Candy goes to Hollywood. It's a porno from 1977, and she would shoot ping pong balls out of her vagina. Oh, look at that. So we, we wrote Dong Show on a bunch of ping pong balls and brought in a bag. So then as she was oh performing, God. we were whipping <laughs> ping pong balls at her. And that just added to the chaos because you could tell she was not happy about that. There you go. Tommy yeah. stirring the pot way back then. And YouTube is blowing up as we speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I, I honestly don't remember a whole lot about her show other yeah. than it was loud. It was lots of lights. It, it, it felt like to me the the show totally overwhelmed the music, meaning the music just didn't matter for, for the plasma. It was just show. noise. It was just it was noise, just nice. which yeah. isn't good. I mean, you want the fans to at least go out and go, that was a great show, but I remember the music. I don't remember one lick of the music that was played during the plasmatics because it was all so overwhelmed by the show. 
but they were nowhere near as bad as some of the other opening acts I've seen. Like, I, or... Yeah. Yeah, I would much rather sit through the plasmatics than Heaven, Vandenberg, Wasp. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, wait, 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 wait a minute. Now. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, because wait a minute, because uh, granted, some of those bands have very poor stage presence. But I got to at least say, at least with Heaven, they, you know, when Heaven was touring, they had a hit song and I knew the song and I enjoyed the song. Vandenberg, the same way. They had a hit song at the time. I enjoyed the song. The Plasmatics, I knew none of the songs, so there was zero for me yeah. to enjoy them. Oh, Nothing God, I had, to sit through, I had to sit through Crocus. Jesus, that was awful. What, oh. tour, was, what tour was that, Crocus? I don't know. Maybe it was Asylum. I, it was It was all that area. It could have been yeah. Lick It Up. I, don't, I honestly I, don't remember. I remember, remember. Cro Crocus was like the go-to third act band yeah. for everybody... I can't tell you how yeah. many times I saw Crocus, Saxon, and Michael Shanker. On, <laughs> yes. on oh, Saxon was one of them, variety too. variety of tours oh. of different bands. They were always the yeah. third go-to act. And it's like, okay, it's it's not bad. It's not bad, but it wasn't great either. But at least no, there was but... one or two songs I knew. Again, I keep going back to the plasmatics. I knew nothing. It was like, right. hey, right. Maybe I can see a nipple. That was all I was interested in. Mm -hmm. But I was so far in the back, you weren't going to see a nipple. But why not? But to your point, why not Night Ranger <laughs> or uh, Thirty Eight Special? Or there was a whole myriad of, of B tier bands that would have made great opening acts. It just for me, I just had to sit through all of it. At least what's his name threw meat out in the audience uh, during the Wasp uh -huh. show. That was at least mildly entertaining. That but... would be Mister Blackie Lawless. Blackie yeah. Lawless, yeah, Blackie Lawless. The rest of it though, it's just oh god, they were so. Bad. Ugh. Well, I got to say, like a Van Halen show. I, yeah, Van Halen also uh, notoriously never really uh, put much into a killer opening act, except for the Horrible. occasional. Yeah, occasionally the cool in the gang thing, like they'll go for an offbeat uh, yeah. band, that you, you know. But yeah. you know, I got to go back to Wasp for a second because there's a point I want to make about them. If we, um, yeah, well, if we them. ever talk about the record. <laughs> but you know what? When Wasp came to town, Asylum uh, animalized Meadowlands. What a show. I've never seen an opening act have everybody on their chairs uh, right from the first song. Really gave Kiss a run for their money. Now, on the Animalized Tour, you weren't going to touch Kiss. Uh, they were a well-oiled machine, so nobody was going to upstage them. But let me tell you, they were damn close to being their equals that night. I, I was pretty amazed. Well, we had Queensryche on the Animalized oh. Tour, and I was just like, please, gaff. Oh, Jesus. You know, this, and believe me, this was Queensryche before Empire, before all this stuff. This was I don't know, their, their, their first that, album, their EP. Their EP. Yeah. Wow. And Mike, was, I saw Queensryche 2 open for Kiss. Uh, I saw one of the Mark St. John shows. Okay. And and uh, Queensryche opened that one. And, yeah, like you're saying, talk about just not getting any reaction from an audience or anything. Just and, a and, waste and, of time. And, and, and maybe it's just because Queensryche's music is yeah. smarter music, if that makes sense. You know, it's... It, it's a different type of – it's not crotch rock. Kiss is just crotch rock, party rock. Have a good – Queensryche yeah. is not that. And it and it it just didn't – it didn't work. Wasp was a great fit. Um, uh, you know, most of the bands I felt were pretty good fits. It was – you know, again, some of them had – listen, Vandenberg, you looked at them and it's like, yeah, there's nothing to look at. But at least there was a song – again, there was a song that was getting a boatload of radio airplay at the time. Yeah, what about Accept? Did you guys catch them opening for Kiss? They, they didn't open oh, for Kiss. Oh, God. That was probably another <laughs> one I had to fucking sit through. No, Accept except didn't except – was on the Lick It Up tour, and Lick It Up tour, we had Heaven Yeah. and um, Night Ranger, I think. Was... Or there Vandenberg in mm -hmm. Heaven. Vanden yeah. And, oh. Well, I saw Accept at Radio City open for Kiss, and um, – Ironically, Udo, with his fatigues, uh, standing on Kiss's tank treads, kind of made for a really good visual. And uh, with Balls to the Wall getting some notoriety at the time, they did all right in, in New York City, which I was fairly amazed about. Well, let, let, let's go back to this album. So let's, let's talk about this, because there's a lot, there's a lot of Kiss throughout this album, not just the 
guest on the guitar and Gene producing it. And, and let's let's be clear here, Reginald Van Helsing is Gene Simmons. So Gene plays bass on this album. Now, does he literally play bass on every track? I don't know. Maybe you know, but he he's 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 Reginald Van Helsing. But there's a lot of Kiss co-writes throughout this entire album. And when you listen to these songs, you can go, holy shit, that's a perfect Kiss song with Wendy O. Williams singing. Right. So, 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 so tell us about this. What do you know about this? Well, you know, uh, it's funny stumbling upon it as a teenager. Uh, I saw something in cream, uh, metal, which was an offshoot of cream. And there was a quote from Wendy Williams talking about the creatures tour. And she said a very flattering quote. She said something like right now, kiss is playing really good, strong, heavy rock, the best they have in a while. And something to the effect of it's an honor to tour with them. Uh, and I believe in that issue or something around that time was that somewhat famous shot of Gene in the studio with Wendy Williams, Wendy O. Williams, not Wendy Williams. And uh, they said, you know, there's a solo record coming. So right away I jumped on it and uh, saw the label, uh, like you said, itemized out with uh, every Kiss connection, you know, shoehorned in the credits and on the front of it and and listened and as a teenager, knew right away I was essentially hearing a Kiss album. Of course, for the contributions uh, in writing, of course, for the playing, uh, the production, um, but also which, uh, what seemed to um, really stand out was the spirit. There's a lot of Kiss spirit in that yeah, record. It really feels yeah. like a Kiss record. I mean, again, yeah. you, you put a female lead vocalist on a Kiss record from the 80s, this is it. This is it. I mean, you know, um, the first song on side A is um, I Love Sex and Rock and Roll, which has a co-write by Gene Simmons. And it's just like, yeah. oh, fuck, that, 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 that is a Gene Simmons kiss song. I mean, totally. of course Gene is going to sing a song called I Love Sex and Rock and Roll. Yeah, and that, that totally sets the tone. Uh attitudinally of course if that's a word uh and sonic not it is now it yeah, is yeah and, and, and sonically too because you know at that point gene's idea of heavy metal and and i think it's an in interesting point because kiss is not natively a heavy metal band uh they have the hard rock influences they have the led zepp but they also had the r and b and things like that so when gene thought heavy at that point You'd get the big, big drums, very caveman, unga bunga, stripped down. And this song exemplifies that. Uh, what a bottom end on this song. I, I think this is the production you would have heard on Creatures um, if you didn't have to work with Paul, per se, where they probably reached an accord somewhere in the middle right. of, about the sound of the record. I, 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 I would also say at the time, if you know, as a Kiss fan back then, Gene was dabbling in starting to produce and work with all sorts of bands. This is when Gene was going Hollywood yep. and sort of defecting from Kiss. This is when Gene sort of left Kiss and let Paul steer the ship through the 80s. But, um, you know, things had run its course there. And, and that's where you see, you know, other ideas uh, become reality. Well, okay, I'll start producing other artists. And Let's remember that before this, the, the most producing Gene did on his own outside Kiss would have been the Virgin uh, recordings which from was, 78. Which had never been released. No, only one single came right. out, I believe, on, on Curb, right? On right. the Curb label. And that was a cover, I think. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But supposedly, I thought there was a whole record done. But, uh, but, that, but I, I, would, I would venture to say, just as a fan... This is Gene's best effort for producing an album. I and, agree. And any out, any any band he's worked with, produced anything he's done, from Keel to Black and Blue to EZO to whoever, this is the best work he has done. Now but we also we have to remember, Mike. That's also kind of a home field advantage because he put in all the Kiss. Connections. Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> yeah. right that. We've got to keep in mind that on this album, he's ve he's playing very comfortably with everybody in Kiss. Basically, at the time, everybody except Peter. Now, it's not 
he's credited as a songwriter on here, but according to Wiki, Vinny also played guitar on Ain't None of Your Business. So you got to think back. In 1984, Gene had every member of KISS, except Peter Chris involved with this record. Yeah, yeah. And, and that that's enough KISS cred for me that's right there. That's pretty big when you think about yeah. it. <laughs> you, you think about it. Um, and, you know, he got Ace, again, this is 1984, he got Ace Frehley to come on this. This was like, oh, my God, you know, Ace is back working with Gene and Paul, and, you know, what does that mean? Now, granted, if could you imagine if the Internet was around back in 1984 when this happened? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't the rumor mills be like, holy shit, Ace is coming back. He's joining Kiss again. Oh, God. No or Wendy O's joining Kiss. Or Wendy. Yeah, so, so, I mean, too. again, this this album would have set the Internet on fire with yeah. all of the Kiss Kiss work here. So, again, we we start off with I Love Sex and Rock and Roll, but the second tune, and this is a tune that, that you know, Mark just swears by, loves by, every, every, you know, It's My Life. It's My Life is the second song on here. Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, a co-write between those two guys, which we talked about this last week. As much as everybody likes to think there's a ton of Simmons Stanley co writes out there, that's kiss lore, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's there's actually not many songs that Gene and Paul co write, and It's My Life is a co write between those two guys, purely just those two guys on this album. Great song on here. Great song. It's a major uh kiss anthem that never was. Uh no doubt. No doubt at all. Uh, it really explodes out of the gate on here. And, uh, you know, this song right here uh, always gave me the idea that Wendy O was really trying to live up to the material. She was stretching, you know. She was going to the hard rock vein, which yeah. meant a little more singing here, hold a note out a little longer, uh, things like that. And she was really trying to uh, mesh with the material and deliver it right. And this song right here, I think, is a definitive version, and that includes the, the creature. Yeah, and that includes the creatures demo for me at least. Um, I, I think she did something special with the vocal that just sold it. Um, and then I, I think we all could agree that um, the re-record down the road was was a great idea, but ah, eh, it, it kind of fell flat. Yeah, I, I I I give Wendy Wendy O. Williams a lot of credit. Her vocals are very well done throughout this entire album. Sure. Especially sure. when you're coming in thinking this is going to be a plasmatics, punk, scream, yell album. She's right. not. She's, she, she doesn't have, she's got a rough, gravelly, n- nasty voice, but she's actually singing with that voice on here, and it works very well. Yeah, yeah. It's a question of perspective. Like you're saying, once you go and, and punch up Plasmatics on Spotify or something, if you don't know them, uh, you'll see how somebody majorly grew right here on this record. And uh, I, I think that's really a, a testament to Gene's production once again. Yeah. I think he was really into doing this record. You know, it's, like you said, it's his first big record out of the gate. Um, he had a bunch of material, a bunch of contributions coming. And he just went for it, and, and I think she got picked up in the momentum as well. Yep. So the third track is Priestess. This has no Kiss connection. It's not a co-write by anybody in Kiss, and nobody in Kiss plays on it. Um, but still a great song. Excellent I love, song. Yes, I love this song. Uh, and, and, you know, I spoke earlier about Gene's interpretation of, of metal, and I think sometimes it can, if you're a big metal guy, perhaps border on on parody almost uh kind of like when you'd see a hard rock band on chips or something uh <laughs> you, you know and and this might be it but i'll tell you if Vinnie vincent didn't play on this song he should have uh that riff is is the overdrive on the guitar the sound um it really begs the question of the timeline when and where this was recorded because this record apparently was done at right track uh kiss was doing work at, at right track uh, you know, it sounds like Vinnie Vincent, and that's just talking about the rhythm guitar guys. This guitar solo, um, I guess it would be officially credited to that guy. Is it Richie Stotts, I believe, is the guy, Mike? Um, according to, we, it would be Michael Ray. 
is credited as the lead guitarist on everything except It's My Life and Bump and Grind. So it should be Michael okay. Ray. So there should have been a Michael Ray invasion then because this guy sounds just like Vinnie Vincent. Yep. I mean, that solo is like overdrive, full Vinnie Vincent. It sounds like it was comped. It sounds like there's three or four pieces that are put together. But to me, that'd be a great question. <laughs> to ask Vinny now, forget his sexuality. I, I want to know if he played on Priestess. Well, I, I, I agree. I, after I was, you know, getting myself ready for this this <laughs> show, it's like, damn, somebody needs to actually ask Vinny what he remembers about his involvement in the Wendy O. Williams album. But, well, you well, know he, what? That's uh, Nobody's talked about this record. And he might actually so remember, you know? Well, He's one he, of those he, guys that actually remembers he, stuff. He definitely. Yes. We'll, we'll get <laughs> yes. to it, but the last song on side two, Ain't None of Your Business, is it, he's got a co-write. It's co-written by Gene Simmons, Eric Carr, and Vinnie Vincent. Yeah. And right. And not listed on the album, but according to Wikipedia, he plays guitar on "Ain't None of Your Business." So he's he was involved with this. So yeah, I would love to, you know. And and we're talking '84. We're also talking a time frame when things were not well in the Kiss Vinnie Vincent world. Were yeah. they ever? Well, that's the whole point. So, you know, what was going on? How, why, why did Gene go in? Uh, still, come on in, Vinny. Oh, hold, hold, oh, wait a second, guys. Let me, let me hit pause here because Mark. Sure. Is, all right. So, <laughs> we want to welcome the third wheel. You know, God, don't, don't bust your ass to get on the show on time here, Mark. I mean, what are you gonna do? You know, make us a priority. <laughs> so anyway. But where are we? Well, 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 welcome, Mark Cicchini. We are talking about this phenomenal, phenomenal Ooh. album. And and I got to tell you, we started the show off with a really great deep dive into some cheap trick before we even got <laughs> Yeah, you missed this. out, brother. Hold on. Can I show this? You guys know about the infamous inside sleeve, don't you? Wow. Uh, All right. Do you, have you guys yeah. seen this? Whoa. I don't have that. Oh, you know why I don't have that mic? There's like what? a Nikki Six guy on there. This is the, I found <laughs> this a at a record Six guy store. On every record this came yes. out two years ago. It's got um, three songs on it. It's live, recorded at Lemoore's in '84. Oh. Fuck rock and roll, okay, ain't none of your business, and bump and grind. Wow, I gotta hear that. I've got that whole show, Mike. Of course you do. Of course you do. You see, I didn't, see, here's where I didn't know because, you know, I joined late into the, into the conversation here. I was a huge, and still am, plasmatics fan. I okay, here's the first guy. There you go. There you go. We, <laughs> Ron, Ron was wondering because he's never seen somebody who was an actual plasmatics fan. Oh, yeah, it's oh. like it's like seeing uh, Bigfoot, you know. Exactly. I don't think he exists. <laughs> all, my, all my buddies. It's funny because I wasn't, I didn't like Metal Wendy that much. I liked the WoW record. Yeah, but I like I like the plasmatics a lot. Matter of fact, it's funny because I listened to this. Uh, I had a long drive. Matter of fact, I talked to Tommy when I was done. I had a long drive for work today, so I, I put this put this in. But when I got done, I kind of felt like you know what? I need some real Wendy, and I threw on the Maggots record and then a coup d'état. I, I love I like the 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 really crazy Butcher Baby. I love that stuff. Matter of fact, uh, if you look on uh, one of the Kiss crews pictures when i'm standing next to pat travers i was wearing a plasmatic shirt well you so so you can speak to this because yeah. you know we were talking about wondering what the reception was for the wow album from plasmatic fans now on online on wiki what? it says it wasn't it was mixed reception it really wasn't well received it was seen as a hard rock album that was basically a kiss album which would make sense because no, not it is the not wow record. The, the wow record's good because the wall record's good because it sounds like Kiss. Yeah, but if you're a Plasmatics fan, that's the question. As a Plasmatics fan, you get the wall right. record, you go, what right. the fuck is this? I see that. I guess maybe I was in a weird place because I was already a Plasmatics fan. And when she went to this, and although, you know, if you want to be fair, I think like Metal Priestess and stuff, she was already kind of going in that kind of direction. Um, but after that, it just, you know, I don't know. I didn't really dig the metal Wendy too much. I, I like when, you know, I like I like the punkier version. 
Um, of, of, and, and matter of fact, I think that's why she went. Although she did come back, like the Maggots record. Now the Maggots record came after yeah. this because they did. Because Wendy O then was like, "Fuck, I'm gonna try, you know, go back to Ron." I'm so I'm sorry. I'm I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, Mark, get to the point here, man. <laughs> but but she was going more commercial. You're right. Like um, Beyond the Valley of 84, is that the record that came right before this, right? Yeah, hold on. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go grab the catalog. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ron, catalog. thank you. You made, Ron, you made him get up out of his chair. All right. So anyway, listen, In Color is a really good record. Yes, it is. I think it's definitive, Cheap Trick, if you ask me. But the re the re record is the one. Yeah. Oh, the uh, the Albini session. Steve. Oh, sure. yeah, sure. way better. See, uh, yes. you know, it, it's funny because if somebody were to ask me, Mike, I need to introduce a fa a fan to Cheap Trick. What should they listen to? I would say either Dream Police or Budokan. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, my daughter, who's uh, fourteen now, is a big Cheap Trick fan, and okay. uh, she fell right in. You know, in, in that area. Um, definitely that stuff is accessible to anybody. It's, it's, uh, it's power pop. It's, it's hard rock. It's, uh, it's beachy at times, you know, to me, um, it's can't lose stuff. Gun, it it the, really is. Gonna raise hell to me is just like, oh, yeah. one of my absolute favorite songs by anybody. If they play gonna raise hell live in concert, I'm freaking coming in my pants. Yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> Dude. Really? <laughs> just size. No, oh, really dude, like the, the, but I just I don't want to know that. The the, the long you. the you know when they ex do a long extended version of Gunna Ray's Hell live in concert, and I've seen them do that. It's like, oh my god, I that is beautiful. Yeah. Well, what do you do when they play Need Your Love? Oh, Love that sorry. song. <laughs> that's flame. long. That's the, the flame. Why, I... The flame. <laughs> the flame. Oh, I'll nothing is worse than nothing kills an audience worse than fucking heaven tonight. Jesus heaven, I can't, I'm not into that. I can't. I'm not that. either. And uh, it's the, I, I call it the setlist killer. And for a and long yes, time, thank you. And you know what? Too, they used to do that back to back in the set. I don't know who came up with this. They used to do Magical Mystery Tour into like heaven tonight. It was like oh, oh it god, it was brutal. How many Too times much. have you seen them? Oh boy. Uh, you know, when I was doing a fanzine, anytime they were in my area in Jersey, uh, tri-state area, I'd go see them every single time. So I, I racked up probably a hundred shows. You okay. know, since the eighties. Yeah. yeah, 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 oh, yeah. And so that, and and I argue with my friend Brent about this all the time because I want to hear "Up the Creek." Oh, I and love like, that That's, song. Thank you. He's like, that's the worst cheap trick song ever made. And he's like, everyone is going to want to hear Heaven Tonight. And no one's going to want to hear Up the Creek. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. Quick Creek question okay. as Mark assembles the Wendy timeline. Yeah. Uh, does your friend like Quiet Riot? No. Oh, okay. Does he no. like The Last Command by Wasp? No. The reason oh, I, I ask it. What are you nuts? That album's great. Oh, shut up, Last Mark. Command, focus. focus. I'm not focus talking on about you. But, but my point is that uh, Spencer Proffer produced all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Spencer Proffer, and I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, was a really good producer, but he was sort of a one trick pony in that you'd get the big choruses and everything. So Up the Creek has that uh, appeal that something like Quiet Riot did uh, with the choruses and everything. So it doesn't sound exactly like Vintage Cheap Trick, but I love well, it. And I don't want to speak for him, but I would be willing to go out on a limb and tell you that uh, he thinks that Quiet Riot and Wasp are a joke. So you're talking about a guy right. who likes Montrose and right. uh, Deep Purple and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, like, all the hair bands, he's just like, you know. Yeah. yeah. And but it doesn't matter. He's wrong anyways because, you know, that's a fantastic song. Up the Creek. I like all that. I love Up the Creek and I love Minecraft. I just don't like the Doctor. Oh. Well, it doesn't matter what you, you think. You also don't like Poison and Warrant. Poison's you like don't like Poison? He what? likes po He loves Poison. It's his favorite. Here, here's he can't like give his left nut to be their drummer. I the Alice Cooper song, Poison, because they both have one thing in common. They sh they're shit? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I tell you what. Brad Michaels is the most soulless singer ever. He is the most white bread. Yeah. Not, and, and the funny part is when he's trying to do that something to believe, I'm like, oh, get off the stage. You blow, man. 
I, I just he, cannot stand those guys. I, I, the thing with Poison for me, how I always loved him is, I always looked at him as the Bay City Rollers of the 80s. I love um, Bay City Rollers. Yeah, me too. I'm a huge Rollers fan. And I think with Poison, they, you know, you can't argue with 10 top 10 hits. I mean, they were they were hit makers and could write a chorus, you know. And and I think, no, you can't go album deep in them and and enjoy stuff. It gets a little too much. But talk about again a, a good time, no pun intended. I think Poison at least delivered on that end. Sure. Well, this was paid for by well, Brett yeah, Michael. Thank well, you. No, but I'm, it's I'm clearly, not. I'm clearly wrong because you're right. They sold millions of records. Doesn't mean that that's my cup of tea. Right. Right. I you know I just think the whole I think Ricky's is. Just, Listen, Mark, 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 Mark also Kyle, thinks Vinny. Like Mark thinks Vinny saved did. Kiss and Carnival of Souls is a great Kiss record. So what yeah, the fuck? So I, I, I see where we're going, Mike. Yeah, you hit a nerve. <laughs> you hit a nerve. But wait a minute, you don't think Ricky Rocket's a good drummer? He's a terrible drummer. I've been playing drums for forty years. I could play better than him with my eyes fucking closed. <laughs> so no is your answer? <laughs> no. Yeah, all right. Make it sure. Let me write that down. I got, all right, got it. Look, look. There's lots of guys like him through the through the years that, you know, hey, those guys, right time, right place. Yeah, that's all. I get it. You know, it's funny. I, I saw them open for Kiss, obviously, a bunch of times. Crowd liked it. You know, it just it just uh, again that guy's voice is, is like you know nails on a chalkboard. He has no range. I mean, that's really the uh, issue with a guy like Brett Michaels. He's he's talking his way but, through. But CC's a good player. Yeah, I like CC. Yeah. He's a good but here's player. the issue: it's not that the songs are bad. I used to like Poison. It's just Brett Michaels personally seems like such a fucking douchebag that that's yeah. what the that, problem that is. Cloud, that doesn't cloud anything with me. Oh, it does for me. I tell you what: I hear music with my ears. I like like number one bad boy up first record. It's Great okay. song. Great the song. T- the title track, I like that song. I'm, you know, nothing but a good time's a good song because it's a Kiss song. It's fucking a total kid. Yeah. yeah. If someone went, hmm, how do I write a Kiss song? That that would be a Kiss song. It just sounds just like Kiss. So, yeah, I always. I mean, now, Mark, you're a drummer, right? Yeah, but you, I, I think you like heavier drumming, right? Like, I like, look, I'm not trying to be a smart. I don't like good drumming. And I think he's not a very good drummer. Yeah, but, I always well, yeah. For, Bonham, I'm more of a Bonham guy, but right, I love. Okay. Let's let's, let's let's literally frame this. This is coming from a guy who's sitting in his basement talking on Skype right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in my basement too. So. <laughs> 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 Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I rock home for this. I... <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Slam, slam Good night. <laughs> Anyways, continue. Right, so you, where, just where, gotta run. you just got to roll with it, man. <laughs> oh, my no, God. For the Brian Mark show. You guys, as soon as I learn how to record this shit. <laughs> as soon as Mark learns how to hit the record button, he's so doing his own show. That's holding he's, you back. he's quitting so and doing his own show. Years. <laughs> he's going to leave us like Vinny left, and it's going to be the Mark Chikini Invasion podcast. <laughs> exactly. Without the, well, forget From it. his basement. So I ain't going there now. I class to join up again. So what are we talking about? Oh my God! Let's let's. let's I love when you hold it. Hold it up, Mike. There, let's, there let's, it is. Let's go back to this <laughs> because we're probably down to one of our twelve listeners by now. Um. All right. So we were just talking about. We just talked about Priestess. We were going through the first the songs by song. So Who is that? Come on. So I can cut you up. All right, so we I'll talked about we I Love go Sex. back now because you were late? <laughs> Give me two seconds. Relax. Jesus. I Love Sex and Rock and Roll, not that great a song. Not a big fan. It's uh, my, probably the greatest Kiss song that Kiss didn't release. Priestess, it's 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 good. It's okay. Next. All right, wait, wait. Go, stay on Priestess for a second. Do you believe that perhaps Vinny played the solo? You know, actually, it's funny you say that because today, I'm, I, I, at times, I was like, I think I hear Vinny. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say, too, I want to, um, 
Well, I rest my case. Buttons never die. Sign sounds a little bit like he's in there too. Well, and and Mark, what we what we were all saying just when you interrupted us and <laughs> threw us off track here is nobody has ever talked to Vinny and asked him what does he remember about his involvement yeah. on this album because it's 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 known that he's got a co-write and he did play guitar on Ain't None of Your Business. But beyond that, what does he just remember? In 1984, with everything that's going on with him and Kiss and his involvement here, what you, you know, nobody's asked him these questions, including us, because it didn't dawn on me until I was listening to this going, shit, I would like to know what Vinny's recollections are of the yeah, Wendy you know Williams what? album. Yeah, we really missed a great opportunity. Again, I, I like this record a lot. It's, it's, it's a good record. It's, as, as, as I started the show off, it is the best Kiss record out there without the Kiss logo on it. Hands hey, down. Mike, it's, also, it's also Gene's best effort as a producer of all the no, albums he's ever oh, produced. The drums sound like shit on this record. That snare sound is way too big. It doesn't fit the music. So which, which other album has he produced that you like better than this? Any, any drum sound better than the shit drum sound on this album. Take your pick. I don't even know, but I know it's got to be better than it. The drums on this record is terrible. Poison? He <laughs> didn't produce any poison. And you can have a shit drummer and have a great drum sound. Like Left for Dead albums? Left for Dead rules. <laughs> is that your band? Is that what yes. that is? Yeah, of All course. Right. Of course. <laughs> oh, my I'll God. I play Mark, Mark, you're just setting them up. You're just setting them up today. Again, I rushed home for this. I'm like, oh my god, it was so pissed. Oh, I this is this is a quality. All right, all right, let's move on to the next song. Wait, let me. Uh, let's go back to that guitar idea for a minute because uh, maybe we should just put it out there right now, kind of round robin it. So we're Vinny played officially on "Ain't None of Your Business," and we're thinking maybe he played the lead on "Priestess." Uh, and Mark said, probably Legends Never Die, right? You, mm -hmm. you feel maybe he played on that. Does anybody else think there's any other parts that maybe he played on? I haven't listened that deep to um, figure out what he would have played on to that level. Yeah. I would throw in, perhaps, and uh, I'd love to know what you guys think. Uh, it's My Life may have been done by Vinny. Uh, and I base this on not so much playing because it's a very stripped down solo that any guitar guy could probably do. But the tone and the sound of it, again, uh, if it's not Vinny, I'm wondering if that guy uh, played through Vinny's gear or something. Because this stuff, you know, some of the rhythm guitar and especially some of the leads really do sound like, you know, circa 1983, 84 Vinny Vincent. You know what we need to do is we need to track down the guy who produced this album and get him on the show. Yeah, yeah. Is he still around, that guy? Or I don't know. I don't know. I talked to him. Uh, not he's, here, sell, but... he's selling soda or <laughs> sugared water or something nowadays. He wanted to he know. Said, I, I was don't on remember. His bus. <laughs> Who are you and why are you on my um, bus? All right. So come on. Track number four, "Thief in the yeah. Night." Yeah. Another Kiss song, co-written co by Gene Simmons and Mitch Weissman. Mitch Weissman's been involved with Kiss, and as we know, "Thief in the Night." Um, appears on what album? Um, um, uh, Crazy Nights. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So you see my or new T-shirt, Mark? Um, Ron, it's been great, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Thief in the Night again. Another. Now we did, we don't know in 1984 that this is a Kiss tune, but obviously, a few years later, it shows up. And and it was one of those things where I'm like, wait a second, I've heard this song before. As I'm playing Crazy Nights, I'm going, I've heard this song before. I know this song. And then you go back. So it's one of those cool little connections that, that happens in the KISS world. But it's just further proof this is a KISS record. This really is a oh, KISS absolutely. record at its heart. Now, all of you heard this version of Thief in the Night before KISS? Or did you hear KISS and then kind of retroactively hear it? No. This this was the first this was the I'm first version I heard. I'm gonna go a step further. When I finally got was it sometime in the late '80s, 
when I got those destroyer demos, I just saw the label. And I said, no, you know, England. Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh my god, is yeah, it yeah, yeah. It was this song, and it wasn't obviously. But, yeah, uh, I remember that too. I I really had high hopes. I'm like, oh, this thing was around in the '70s, I but no. Oh. So thing. so the last song on side one, Opus in C minor seven. And and yeah. I, I don't know why, as a fan, I always looked at that opus and come seven is always what I in my head is what I said when I saw that. You worked in the porn industry, Tommy. That's the second reference to. <laughs> there you there you go. Semen. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. this song I I actually like this song a lot, yeah. and it really surprised the hell out of me because lyrically, it's not what you would expect. Now who wrote who wrote this? This was written by. Um, her manager. Yeah, Swenson was involved in this. Yep. Uh, no, and... no, no, kiss involvement in this, but no, it's a very. No. Um, I don't. At, how, how, would you, how would you say politically a, a, an activist type song? It was talking about acid rain. It, you know, it was something where you were like, "What the hell is Wendy O. Williams all of a sudden getting yeah. a yes. conscience?" Dioxins are dioxins talked about. and yeah, all of that, and it's just like well, you guys obviously haven't heard Twelve Noon then. No, no, no. I haven't heard any other Plasmatics stuff because I wasn't a Plasmatics fan. How can well? Uh, that's how come you haven't been a Plasmatics fan? You didn't fucking listen to it because it was too punk. To it. Too punk a, for me. At Twelve Noon tomorrow, I love right. that. See, I can't believe you guys don't know Twelve Noon. And you got Moran. You know that? Can I you? never heard that one, and, and I've heard some oh. of their stuff, but. God, why am I here? I know mostly the plasma. We're, don't, I, we're like asking the same the question because we were doing just <laughs> fine until you disrupted everything. But, but um, this opus is, is interesting because it's um, the most non-sounding Kiss song on the record. Um, and it's actually produced really well. It, it kind of mm-hmm. starts out like uh, Sting has also uh, had a hand in the writing of it. It sounds like the police to me in the beginning of it. It's a it. very dramatic sounding song. Yeah. 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 You, you're right. It doesn't sound like Kiss. It definitely is not a plasma. It's one of those songs where you're just like, this is good, but is she doing this? Yeah. There's a lot of styles coming together on that song. You have, uh, like we said, we have this kind of offbeat beginning to it. There's a little piano mixed in with the guitar chords, uh, the topic. And then uh, also the way she sings the oh yeahs, which I thought were kind of cool because um, Wendy O. Williams being punk and everything, that's a big thing, you know, from the Ramones. You know, you could put a lot of feeling into just singing yeah or now. And I, I think she conveys that well in the choruses. I, I love this song. It's one of my favorite songs on the album. Yeah, Definitely. it's a good tune. It, it's a yeah. really, it's a, it's a pretty underrated song on the album, again, because we're looking for the Kiss stuff, you know, as Kiss fans. But And you may pass this one over, but this just stands on its own. As a, as a well done track, it, it's well, one of it's superior. one of those songs where you may not pay attention to the lyrical content the first time through, but then when you go back and listen to it a second time, and you start listening to the lyrics, you're like, "Wow, that's some pretty heavy lyrics in this." Well, and I think it's a fair question also to ask: How readily available is this? Can you find it on Spotify? It Can is you on find Spotify. It? Okay, so for people that are listening to the show that have, don't know what we're talking about, it's easy to find. So you can listen for yourself and be the judge. Well, here, here's the thing, too, about Spotify. Uh, when you punch it up, you have to punch up Plasmatics, and then it's not in the Plasmatics discography, but you have to scroll down, and it says appears on WOW. I was so going to say, if you, if you search for yeah. Wendy Williams' It's My Life, It'll show up in the search results as the Wow album, and then you can go find it because it's it's under yeah, a weird. Kinda, the name yeah. is weird. The the name is weird that Spotify all, all, has it under. All kidding aside, if you like the Wow record, Metal Priestess, that's the cover. Metal Priestess is an EP, and it really is the kind of crossover metal, but. Lunacy, the Doom song, Black Leather Monster especially, and 12 Noon, and Master Plan, that EP just fucking smokes. I mean, it's very much, it's it's metal, but it's a punky metal. Yeah, and Master not, Plan is, uh, Master Plan's like classic plasmatics. Yes, correct. Well, matter of fact, even Motorhead covered Master Plan. Um, That's let me right. Um, That's right, yeah. Again, uh, you know, 
big fan of both those bands. Um, so, yeah, here's something, too, that I think it's very important for our audience, especially those with a good sense of humor. Are, have any of you guys ever seen uh, the SCTV, the Canadian show, um, with John Candy, the, uh, he, when he, with, he does the fishing musician? You ever seen that? No, I, when, I remember the show. Wendy O does a segment on that. Matter of fact, I'm going to post it on our Facebook site. That 15 minutes of, is pure comic gold. They have got John Candy with the plasmatics, <laughs> supposedly at a fishing uh, lodge up in Canada. And uh, it, is, it is fucking hilarious. And on top of that, Wendy, uh, Wendy performs, and it is just awesome. Um, really, that whole sort of era is very kind of Creatures of the Night-ish. To wait, wait do you see her costume with the, all the big black stuff and uh, the way the band looks and the presentation? I think it's Gil. I'm trying to remember. I was doing it off the top of my head. It's, it's anyways, but if you, if you go on YouTube, SCTV, Fishing Musician with Wendy O. Williams and the Plasmatics, it's up there. I've, I've turned a lot of people on to that, and everyone's like, oh my God, this is the greatest freaking thing. So hopefully you guys uh, dig that. And it's, it, you know, again, it's, it's good metal. I think you guys will like it. So, onward and upward. Onward. So, side two. Side two is really where we get a lot of the kiss um, placements ready, and reference. Ready to rock is just horrible. So, it's so like, we yeah we start horrible. off with ready to rock. Now, there's no co-writes on this, and there's no kiss involvement in the plane. But again, you can just feel ready to rock is like a Wait kiss a song. That's where Paul played rhythm guitar, right? On Ready to Rock? Um, oh, no, you're right. He did. Paul That's, did do yeah. rhythm guitar on Ready to Rock. You're right. My mistake. Yeah. So Paul's on, on guitar on Ready to Rock. And again, Ready to Rock is just, it's a freaking Kiss song. Huh, it, it's it, a very bad cliche, sort of, you want to rock. Sort yeah, of. well, again, that's something that Gene would write. And now, it, he's not credited yeah. with writing this, but it's, cl you know, you listen to that and go, that's, that's the type of song Gene would do for Kiss in the 80s. Not yeah. fan yeah. Ready to Rock, but oh boy, the next three. So Ready but, to uh, Rock kicks it off. Again, no co-writes, but Paul Stanley's guitar on there. So you're starting yeah. right off with Paul Stanley on track one. I think Ready to Rock is strange, uh, for sure. It, it starts out, uh, I remember hearing it, and I was like, what is this, MASH? Like a, a weird MASH episode or something? It almost sounds like helicopters in a distance or something. It sounds like a battlefield. And then it has that lumbering, you know, um, uh, almost a parody-like heavy metal riff. And then it has uh, that one lead part that's not the official solo. I always thought that maybe Paul did that. Uh, that's a real simple, notey thing out of the shoes of, say, I Love It Loud or something. And then also, to me, I don't know if you ever recorded with it in a studio, but I always pictured the B.C. Rich he always played, the standby one, the, the cheetah print uh, eagle that he had. To me, I always heard that on that track. That could be wishful thinking, but I'd, I'd like to think it's there. Um, and, of course, he didn't play the solo, which is kind of nondescript. So... Uh, but I think he's 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 all over that one. I, I, and I think, yeah, it's definitely cliche. But there's some interesting things going on with the production. Massive bottom end, tons of echo and reverb. Um, so it's notable for that, if anything. Now, the next tune, is, as Mark said, um, Bump and Grind. This yeah. has Ace Fraley <laughs> on lead guitar on Bump and Grind. Again, no, no kiss involvement in the songwriting, at least as as credited on the album. But again, bump and grind, Ace Frehley on guitar. This just reeks of a kiss song. Again, I always like this one the best. Yeah, I tell you what, uh, uh, that song is just it's Wendy in her element. This is what I have a problem with when I say when she went to her metal phase, out of the punk phase. When they tried to give her songs like, you know, Ready to Rock, it just didn't sound genuine. Bump and Grind sounds like, fuck, she, she means it. You know what I mean? It's, it, she's not selling you something. It's, 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 that's how she, her delivery, do you want to bump? You know, she, that's what she does. Whereas yeah, her, like, her, trying her, to fake her way through a Twisted Sister chorus isn't. 
her vibe and attitude is totally there. And I, I like the uh, the one fingered chords in that. Again, very Kiss uh, with, with the rhythm guitar work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you're so that's right. That's exactly. Good. Now, the, the the interesting thing here is, if you look on the back, where it lists all the credits, Ace Frehley gets called out on his own. Yeah. He's listed yeah. as special yeah. guest Ace Frehley, lead guitar, bump and grind, and then lumped together is Paul Stanley, Eric Carr, Mitch Weissman, Mickey Free. That's kind of interesting when you think about it. Oh, it's fascinating, actually. Uh, when was this done? Where was it done? Was this an old demo that Gene just pulled the solo off of it? Uh, it again, something never asked to anyone throughout you know, the time since. Um, I, I think, you know, Mike, we're talking about the recording and release dates, and maybe Mark can help out with this. I always felt that this was mostly recorded during 83. Is that correct? It said, I, I, Wiki says it was recorded 1983, released 1984. Okay. Because the Kiss situation, of course, was drastically different, you know, one year prior. You talk about Vinny's involvement, a situation that went from, you know, bad to terrible. So, but during that earlier part, I could definitely see, you know, Vinny coming in, plugging in and, you know, earning his keep, you know, and, and wanting to do it. Uh, but back to the Ace thing, how do you guys feel about that solo? Phenomenal. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. And again, and again, yeah. you put yourself back. That, that, that little, dit, 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 you know, that, that classic ace. Put yourself back in 1984 when this came out as a Kiss fan. This has got Ace Frehley playing lead guitar. Ace is not in Kiss. You haven't heard yeah. from Ace. You have right. not heard anything right. from Ace. All of a sudden, Ace shows up on this. Holy crap. Yeah, it, it's a real big deal. Uh, if you're a Kiss fan back then, especially because the guy's gone out of Kiss, you're not hearing much about what he's going to do next. And um, that solo is is fairly incredible to me. It's actually like two guitar solos, he kind, which is which is atypical for Ace. He goes into that solo uh, and then they're into the solo proper. They do like a whole intro part and then he's doing all kinds of Aceisms. But his playing and, and guitar players out there would probably agree with me. It's a very fluid ace solo. Like he he's not rusty on that track. No, 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 not not at all. This a, 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 as as if you wouldn't have bought this album just because Gene produced it. The simple fact that there is one Ace Frehley lead yeah. guitar solo yeah. on here was just cemented. You were you were you were tracking this album down. And let's be honest, you you did have to do a little hunting for this album because. When it came out back then, it was not major label release. You had to go find this. Yes. Yeah. I tell you what about this record before it came out. At least, you know, again, I was a fan fanzine junkie and everything. The the word on the street was the whole thing was original. It was, it was all piss. It was songs they didn't have on Creatures of the Night. So there was a mystique before I even got it. You know what I mean? Because right. that's what the right. fans were talking about. And it really delivers on that angle. If you're a fan of the of the Lick It Up and Creatures period, which many Kiss fans, you know, that's a prime time for them, and, and myself included. You, this record is right there. It you fits need right to have in. this it album. It fits oh, so yeah. nicely in there. Again, it's yes. a Kiss record with a female vocalist, but don't think Stevie Nicks vocalist. Wendy o. Williams has got a great voice to sing Kiss tunes. Yeah, well, it kind of only what? adds to it, you know. Mo moving on, though, but here... Because this is one of the reasons I was like, you know, I had a crazy day, and I, but I didn't want to miss because this record I like a lot. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's phenomenal, but I like it a lot. But at the same time, because the next song is Legends Never Die, Wendy can't handle this song. Her voice just doesn't fit. I, I think I think Kiss should have done this on Creatures because it, it's kind of ballady in a way. And, and yeah. I think it, it for my taste... Because I always thought I Still Love You brought Creatures down. It's not that it's a horrible song. I just never thought it fit in. It, to me, on Creatures, that's the only song I, I kind of skip over. Yeah, so I think we all, I think every, everybody here agrees that uh, Legends Never Die should have been on Creatures, right? And, and, yes, and, 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 yeah, and let's, let's just be clear. Oh. No, it would have slowed, because that's what they were looking for, a little light and shade with having a bath on. You know what I mean? This is a song more so than I Still Love You, because it wasn't quite a, a delicate ballad. It, it, but, it, you know, it's, it's got a great chorus. It's got a, gr 
the, the oh, lyrics. Yeah. It's just that again, Wendy, God love her because I'm a Wendy fan. But this this song is just not suited for her. That's all. Well, I, and, I and let, let, let let's be clear. You know, according to Wiki, this is an unused Kiss song from the Creatures of the Night album. It was a demo called "When the Legend Dies," and they basically just put Wendy's vocals in place of Gene's vocals. Right, right. I, I, you know, you, there's always a famous debate in Kiss circles. And everybody says, it's my life should have been on Creatures. And I love it's my life. And, and I love it. And, but you know what, Mark? I'm going to say maybe in terms of Creatures, it may have been the wrong track at the wrong time if it came down to a debate of whether or not to include Legends Never Die or It's My Life. I feel Legends Never Die fit into the, the survival spirit, the rebirth thing that Kiss was trying to do on Creatures. I th- again, I agree with you. I think they should have taken off, the, you know, I still love you and put Legend Never Die. And I will still say they would have had not breakthrough great success. But if they would have done a video for It's My Life, MTV, a, a good MTV video with where the, you know, those lyrics are they're they're made for a teenager, you know, yeah. those yeah. They're tailor made for that, and I think they could have gotten a little bit more radio play with that than I Love It Loud. No, I love it. I love it loud. I love the whole Yeah, me too. Album, the whole. Yeah, me too. But <laughs> you, Tommy, oh. you don't like creatures? <laughs> no, I, I hate that one song. Oh, okay. I love it loud. Oh. Tommy doesn't no. like Lick It Up. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Lick It Up either. I'm sorry, it's like man. I told you the Ron and Mark show coming soon. <laughs> to a, uh, podcast yeah, here, here. <laughs> now, but, and we didn't mention this, but Eric Carr plays drums on Legends Never Die. And you can so tell those those drum fills are and like he does it well. Essential fucking Eric Carr drum. Fills. Yeah. yeah and, cool. and as I said, side two is really filled with the Kiss performances. That's the side that's got all the Kiss playing going on through it. Yeah, I, I really want to say, too, about this track, um, it really should have been on Creatures. And I'll, I'll go one further, and I'll say leave I Still Love You on the record and go to a solid 10 tracks on Creatures and, and put this somewhere in the track I list. Hate, 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 yeah. hate I Still Love You. The song it, it, grinds me. Long, oh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't hate it. It's just it's too long. Goes it, nowhere. It goes, it goes yeah. nowhere. It's yeah. like trotting through mud. You're like, oh, come on, let's go. Look, look. Paul does an incredible job vocally. It, it's it, it's played well. I get it. But I just remember as a teenager having creatures. That was like the one I'm like, oh, come on, man, I'm rocking here. And they, they yeah. you know, kind of took the air out of the. Yeah, uh, cre- of the creatures but, doesn't need a ballad. Creatures of well, the night didn't need a, a ballad but that's on the whole it. Thing. I think that's how come I like. Legends Never Die so much. It's not quite a ballad, but it would have given a little bit of light and shade. Oh, yeah. On, oh, yeah. On creatures. I, it really I think um, I Still Love You suffers from having a third verse, uh, which is kind of a rarity in, 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 you know, in the Kiss world. And instead of a third verse, it should have had a bridge. And, and maybe it would have changed things up a little bit, and it wouldn't have been so sleepy time bye-bye there, you know, with the, the same... Thing That's going a, on over and over. Of that. That's brilliant, Ron. Again, when's the show start? <laughs> we do the we, we we do the best analysis. We are analyzers. We are the best analysts. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh and I think I think critics at the time would have picked up on Legends Never Die. I, I think it's a pretty bold piece of songwriting from Gene. Uh and, and and in spite of Wendy, you know, I think, yeah, okay, maybe not the best singer for it. But those backups are, I hear Eric yeah, Carr, yeah. Gene Simmons. Um, the drum track is awesome. That little beat he does there uh, in the chorus, I mean, excuse me, the solo, it, it, it's, it's, a li- it's not off time, but it's different for Kiss. It's, it's really cool. Um, a strong cha- notice, track. You know. Did you notice the, the Carnival of Souls uh, line in there? Yes, uh, the New York Times. Times, yes. Absolutely. So, Tom, we, Mike, did you notice the Carnival of Souls line in there? No, <laughs> Carnival of Souls sucks. I don't notice anything about that album. That so we're it's funny we're talking about the greatest album not to have a Kiss logo on it. Carnival of Souls is the worst album to have a Kiss to logo have a on. Kiss logo well, look on it. at Tom. I tell you what, we've had a great time today. 
All right, track <laughs> track nine in the final one, and you know it's it's sort of sad because it's like this is such a good album, and there's only there's only nine songs on it. The last song, "Ain't None of Your Business," written by Gene Simmons, Eric Carr, yep, Vinnie Carr. Vincent, and Vinnie Vincent plays guitar on this. This is just another Kiss song all over it. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very, uh, to me, I hear like, this is a very asylum track almost, too. It's a uh, very up, you know, happy. And, you know, Mark, since you know a lot about Wendy Williams, didn't she do this live, too? Like, wasn't this a big live track for her? Um, I told you, that was right during the I, the metal era I was not a big fan of. But hold yeah. on. I'll go grab her live DVD. But, but I, do you it, have it, 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 Chaos? it is live on this, this EP I got. This is awesome. He keeps getting Mark to get up. This is fantastic. It is. We can't get him to <laughs> get, get out, out of his chair. Shit. The only time he gets out of his chair for us is when it's time to go eat. I'm mm-hmm. going to ask him for, yeah. <laughs> now, so, well, while he's getting that, let's talk oh, about Wendy Williams. Live show. Here's the set list. Oh, there he is. I'm trying to think of what they did off of this record. Uh, Ain't None of Your Business. Yep. Ain't None of Your Business they did live. Here's the track list. What, now, what is that? A boot? That's a bootleg. It's a bootleg. Okay. And but, what's uh, what's on there from Wow? Is any is anything on there from Wow? Hmm. Is anything on there from Wow? Yeah, bump and grind and ain't none of your business. Oh, okay. Just those two. those two. That's it. Yeah. This is from I think England. So, yeah, I think she was big in England. Dallas, London. Yeah, very big over there. Yeah. I, again, I, I like the, uh, the the Butcher Baby stuff. Uh, I, I, don't, I just like the the, the, the punky stuff. It, when they when she started going to commercial. Op- are you opening it? Yeah. Nice. It's just that, shrink Mark. wrap. Here's I've the never... unboxing. Oh, that doesn't buy. It's not Kiss. Can hold, Mike, hold that up because I don't own that. I want to get that. <laughs> Is that awesome. a promo? No. Give me the set. Let's go, go up close to the... It, three songs. All right, fuck and roll. Ain't, oh, ain't none of your business and bump and grind. I bet you they're from this show. This, is, would... re- this is recorded November 24th, 84 at Lemoore's. Oh, okay. Well, that's from New York. So I that's the that, WOW I tour. Have show, though. I have that show, too. And that's the tour for that record, correct? That's the WOW tour, if you will? Like, No, no, it's not. Uh, interesting. You know what's interesting? It's the Commander of Chaos. Tour. It's, it's a one. It's a one side right. twelve inch. The back side has nothing on it. But, yeah, yeah that's, that, that is it's like an it's like an uh, like a uh, um, a Crocus Greatest Hits. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, the Wa- Wasp Greatest Hits. Wasp. Was yeah. It, wasn't Screaming in a Night a Crocus song? Was that a yeah, Crocus tune? Great tune. That's a, that's a pretty good song, actually, oh, right? Dude. Oh, Heat Strokes off the first one. Heat Strokes! Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Hold on. There's, they got, oh. Oh, Mark um, is singing was, uh, for us. Good Lord. Oh, my God. Uh, Headhunter's fucking awesome. Headhunter! That's great. <laughs> Ball, Ball Ballroom Blitz. Blitz. Oh, wait. No, that's, yeah. not a, that's not a good oh, one. God, they destroyed oh, that God. song. Tommy, they killed uh, schools out too. I know. Yeah. yeah. Cro- Crocus are sort of like Quiet Riot. Crocus are sort of like Quiet Riot. They're only known for covering other people's songs. In the states, at least, yeah. Yeah. And listen, the Crocus videos. Oh my God, were those videos awesome in the '80s or what? Running around in loincloths. Look, look, <laughs> they got ruined. There's another band they got ruined by the fucking record company. Because one voice at a time was fucking incredible. That whole re- Are you ready? Ready to burn? Matter of fact, uh, Rob Halford sings backgrounds on that. Oh, wow. that made it better. Now, wasn't there a song, too, where... <laughs> didn't they try to rewrite Heavens on Fire? Was that Crocus? I, I thought they had a song with kind of a, a Paul kind of yodel thing in the beginning or something. And, uh, Probably. Like, they wrote a Heavens on Fire. Thing. That shit's terrible. Again, one, for the fans out there, get one voice at a time. It is one of my favorite metal records. It is Don't such it. an incredible album. Don't do it if you have any no, self That metal rendezvous is fantastic. Don't Long don't listen to don't boom. listen to Mark's taste in music. Good Long lord. Boom is like one of the greatest songs ever. 
Can I? They had some good Can stuff. I? All right, all right. So, so the only place you ever hear that stuff is in the men's restroom at a roadside stop. So, oh. quest, question, guys. <laughs> question for all three of you. Yes. Wendy Williams' Wow album. Did Vinny Vincent save Wendy Williams? <laughs> no, remember, we're changing that now. Well, just wait. This, this yeah. fits this because, you know, Vinny okay. co-wrote and played on this. Did he save the Wendy Williams album? No, Gene, Gene did. Gene did. Uncle it was part Gene. of his overall saving, I would yeah. say. It was Uncle Gene. Yeah, I agree. But, uh, you know, you know the, the rebranding of Wendy O. Williams, which I know, Mark, you know, I, I, I know as a Plasmatics fan you weren't into, but she kind of had a little run on the heels of this record. Um, well, she had this, and she got some notoriety with the video for It's My Life, which actually got play, uh, played on cable. I don't know if anybody remembers seeing it. On, I remember I think, it on once Night or Flight. twice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it got some notoriety for that, which got her Reform School Girls. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and then she ended up hosting uh, on USA. Uh, yep. Everybody the seen the clips of her. Yes, yes. So she had a little run there, you know, for a while. I, and I guess we could attribute it to Wow. Well, and it looks yeah, like it, unless it, the video for the Damned was a was pretty popular. Uh, that's what she. Um... Yeah. Uh, that off the coup d'etat. I think it's coup d'etat. Yeah. Well, and it looks like some cable station now is going to be replaying all of those night flights. Yes, night flight is coming well, back. I don't remember well, which you, network. If you truly want to get into the like the good plasmatics, so, though, these are the three you want. This is happens to be a dual CD, but uh, The uh, New Hope for the Wretched, Metal Priestess. Now, I'm all kidding aside. This is this is the one you're going to want to check out. Uh, Lunacy, the Doom Song, Black Leather Monster, and Twelve. You got to check out Twelve Noon. Twelve Noon, just fucking rules. That song is just so fucking cool. And then uh, Beyond the Valley of 1984. You, you can't go wrong with those. Mark, what album is Fast Food Service on? Um, I think that that's. I think that's on that one. Hold on. Um, that's one on one of the early ones. Oh, you know, while you're looking at that, I want to say about the wow thing, it's very interesting that Wendy Williams had a lot of plasma. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That's the one. It is on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think it's really interesting, too, that um, so you have all these plasmatics people involved on the record, except John Beauvoir. And yes, that's yes. fascinating because then he goes to the Paul side of things. Con and works yes, with Paul. considering yeah. at this time, that's when he became involved with Kiss. Yeah, yeah, you'd figure he'd be right there, but mm -hmm. it's kind of curious. And considering that that, that 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 post plasmatic Jean Beauvoir pretty much went totally melodic, so yeah. you would have felt this yeah. would have been right in his wheelhouse. Yeah. To do. Yeah. And he went, you know, of course, worked with Paul, and then he did Animal Boy by the Ramones. He produced that that record. That um, I saw that tour. Animal you saw Boy. the Animal Boy tour? I did it. <laughs> Tracks in Detroit. Um, I have a great story on that, real quick. That that show on the Animal Boy would have been what 86, 85? 86. Yeah. I went down. I was working, um, and my band. We were, fuck. We, were, we used to play at this club called Harpo's all the time. And, and Harpo's, uh, sure. So, anyways. I work all day. Um, you one all night. I knew at uh, at 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 uh, Harpo's. It's like, hey, I'm working over tracks. I'll just get you in. It was one of those summer days in Detroit where it was like 95 degrees with 100 percent humidity. It was just one of those Midwestern, just you know, just hot days. I'll never forget. By the time the Ramones went on, it was just a little club, and this to this day is one of my greatest rock and roll memories. I went there, met a couple friends there. It was so hot inside the club, like even the girls. Everybody had their shirt off, and it was it wasn't a sexual thing. But it was just it was just fucking that oppressive. And the fucking Ramones never took their fucking leathers off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wah, wah. And yeah. The, the I remember walking <laughs> the when the when the fucking walls were just from the condensate. It looked like they were bleeding. You know what I mean? It was just water. It was just it was that much condensation in the fucking. But it was one of the greatest. The whole fucking again, it, the place only held maybe a thousand. It's like a maybe. thousand people, right? Harpo's uh, like a thousand, maybe. Well, no, Harpo's was about two and a half, three. But this isn't at Harpo's. This is at a club called Tracks. But oh. I knew people 
people that were working that from Harpo's there, they're like, because it was sold out. They're like, I'll get you in. Don't worry about it. So I got in, me and a couple of friends. And again, it was so hot and everybody was packed up and it was just, it was, but it was just like rock and roll heaven, man. And the Ramones just didn't let up. And again, it's so, but they never got out of character. They never took the fucking no. It's Like, <laughs> I don't know how the fuck they got through the set. And again, you want to talk about changing their sound a little bit. Animal Boy was really, I mean, that song alone almost sounds like fucking Ace of Spades. I mean, you could tell they yeah. were listening to Motorhead and stuff then. Yeah, and then John Beauvoir, though, he also made them go very commercial on that record with some of the songs, too. Um, so it's really funny. This, this one opening act on the Creatures of the Night tour uh, ended up blossoming into this, you know, Lost Kiss record we have. Uh, John Beauvoir goes and, and, and plays bass on Kiss Records. Uh, and, 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 you know, does more too. Didn't he co-write something? He co-write. He co-wrote mm -hmm. with, with Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to find another Kiss opening act that ended up working with Kiss in the post life, except of course, black and blue. Black and blue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of interesting, but if nobody has the wow record, they need to get it. Uh, it was reissued on vinyl, I believe, right? Is that the one you have, Mike? Or... Well, this is the original what? vinyl from 84. Yeah. the original vinyl. Now, that's what I was kind of kidding. I don't know. If... I did briefly show. I probably shouldn't have. I'll show it from back here. The This was a reprint, I want to say from Europe. This yeah, was the CD. This is a 1988 version, and it's got uh, Porno Wendy on the, on the inside. So... Yeah, yeah. I think I had that. Nice actually. job with the with the reissue. It, 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 it the... has been difficult to find on physical, on vinyl or CD. Yeah. Um, I think at times there's been pirated copies that have been released. Uh, basically, I would say if you can find it, regardless of whether you think it's official or not, pick it up. You yeah. can definitely well, wait, find you that's... can find it on Spotify for sure, so you can at least listen to it. But that's what. That's what I did with this. What this is, if you can see, I couldn't track down the 45s. So somebody on the, I did, I mean, I bought this probably 15, 20 years ago, right? When you were able to start burning DVD or CD. Yeah. But all the, all the, all the uh, um, 45s and stuff, they just put them, somebody put them all on CD and they did a great job on the transfers. I mean, the, the Butcher Baby EPs from 1978. I mean, it was just cool to be able to get the original. I don't know how much you know about the band, but the original band, the punk band, they, they kind of just ditch them. Uh, Ron did. Rod did. And that's when he got, uh, okay, they got rid of the drummer. And they, I don't, Yeah, there were some changes. Yes. I remember that. And, yeah. And again, yeah. If, if you get, there's a great um, official Wendy O. Williams DVD, and it covers everything. Oh, um, really? I gotta check yes. that out. Uh, there's actually two. If you go to the official plasmatic site, there's one like two hour documentary, which is fantastic. And then he just matter of fact, guys, when we were at Spooky, I bought the I bought the other one. Because I couldn't I could never find it. And uh, when we were in Orlando just a few weeks ago, I bought the official uh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was like uh, Lost Tapes or something like that. But it, it's official, it's through Rod. It's funny, I just looked up. And this is kind of cool, too. The pier. I don't know if you've ever seen that. This is an official. Oh, show. the New York show, right? Yeah. Pier 80. What was pier what? <laughs> I'm trying to pier uh, at it. Uh, uh, pier 62? Now, pier 62. Bring that back. That brings back the cheap trick because they played there, I think, in the post one on one era, uh, right before Next Position, please. Yeah, yeah, I've oh, seen footage. Of fact, that, that's lost. it. That new, that new lost one. You're absolutely right. That was the uh, Dr. Pepper um, concert series in in Central Park. That's yes. That's what that's yep. from. Um, wow. Uh, that wow. new thing that just came. out. because I, I matter of fact, I watched it last weekend. Wow. That's cool. So, yeah. so you know, depending on how much of a completist you are in Kiss vinyl or Kiss recordings, um, but if you want to collect. Kiss related recordings, which I like, I like to do. Um, you definitely need to get the Wow album in your collection. It's got more yeah. Kiss related stuff to it than pretty much 
any non-Kiss album you'll find out there anywhere. Because most of the yeah. other Gene-related stuff that he's done, Gene's produced it. I think uh, he might have had, and I'm, I might be getting albums mixed up, he might have had Peter Chris come on and do a guest yes. vocal on one track. But Best there was of the ne- West. Yeah, yes. there, there was never yeah. another third-party album that had this much Kiss member involvement going on it. Absolutely. This the, the this the distant second on that would be Black and Blue's Nasty Nasty, I'd say. Yeah. Just by virtue of Gene producing it, uh it having the domino riff, uh and then yeah, Peter singing on it. Exactly. So I mean this by far and away needs to be in your collection because there's just so much kiss on this. Legends again, never die alone in it's my life too. I mean just I mean you got again, you just gotta think in eighty three when this was recorded, eighty four when it came out, a very dramatic time for kiss and every living member of kiss except for peter chris was involved on this album yeah it it really is another piece of the story in those uh somewhat more obscure days of the early 80s in in kiss um you know with kiss's albums themselves uh i'll throw in peter solo releases you know during that same time frame and then of course the wow record um if you don't have especially the wow record you're you're missing a significant piece of what was going on musically at that time and 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 i know a lot of people are like yeah a lot of third party stuff that kiss has been involved with isn't the most enjoyable music this is really fucking good i mean are you there you, i got yeah. you you can you can still listen to this today this this mm-hmm. sounds really good i did <laughs> yeah I, I i did too i listened to it today yesterday i mean it just it's held up it holds up really good Again, I, I want people to be, again, this is just my opinion. I think it's a good record. I mean, it's not Creatures of the Night. I don't think it's earth-shattering, but it's a very solid. I mean, for my taste, again, you know, I, I thought, like, with the whatever, um, Christ, was that fucking song? Oh, here it is. Ready to rock, I just, again, it's just so formula, so, eh. And the same thing with the I Love Sex and Rock and Roll, it just, it, it just seemed forced. It didn't seem, like, natural. And again, that's coming from somebody, I always say, timeline's everything. I was a Plasmatics fan. Right, right. And, and when it right. came out, I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't what I right. want. But it didn't suck either. I mean, it was, it was good. But I, it's not, it wasn't Butcher Baby. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah, it's a, a far it's a far cry from Butcher Baby. Yes. This so. was a a really nice surprise as a Kiss fan in 1984. It was. It was. You it was like getting yes. a bonus Kiss album that you did not know was coming. Absolutely. At the time, I bet you I played Bump and Grind a thousand times. I just just to hear Ace. You were so right, Mike. Because right then it was like. Oh my God, he's still playing. This is fine. It's it's such a great ace solo. Like you said, Ryan, there's so many acisms. It's like he crammed his whole library into that one solo. You know, it was just like so cool. And back before the internet, at that point, it feels like Ace had been gone forever. You're right. Yeah. We didn't have the. Yeah, you didn't. You and didn't know what he was doing or what he planned to do. And I'd love to know if that was recorded at his home studio. Could be. We've never really had a good interview with anybody involved in this delving yeah. into the story of this album would be nice it really would be well we got to find somebody let's track down the producer let me ask you too um i you know just going back to a couple random thoughts i had um thief in the night uh Kind of a round robin thing. Does everybody agree that it's better than the Crazy Nights version? Yeah. Okay. Oh my yeah. God, Mike, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, you feeling all right, man? Did you hear the question right? Yeah, he said <laughs> better than, not <laughs> as good that. as. <laughs> Thief in the Night on Wow is better than Thief in the Night on Crazy Night. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Wow. All right. All right. All right. And I think it really is. I think um, while it may be better produced on Crazy Nights uh, and they tried to slow it down a little bit and make it a little funky. I think Bruce in particular is great on that track. Um, 
I think uh, she added a certain wickedness to her the voice, vocals. her vocals. Yeah, yeah. Gene's too laid back on it. He's almost too much like an old time radio storyteller on that song. Uh, she is the thief in the night. I, lo- the I loved her. Vo- the- I loved her vocals throughout the entire album. It yeah. was, you know, it's it's not your pristine female vocalist. It's it's a raspy, nasty, dirty, but she's not screaming and yelling. So it 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 worked really well for this this hard rock style. I still would rather hear Monkey Soup. Have you ever heard that song? Yeah, I just listened to it before. Oh, isn't that fucking song awesome? I love Great it. song. You know, Great monkey, song. You, you look just like a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking love that tune. You guys need to get into the plasmatics, guys. I They're tried, fun. couldn't, couldn't. It just well, d- it didn't work. Didn't hey, work. Mark, the plasmatics opened for the Ramones a few times, right? I, you know what? I, I, that I don't. I'm sure they yeah. probably did. Cross. I'm thinking they did for some reason, but yeah. Now I, I think we, we, we need to mention, and I don't have it in front of me right now. Maybe somebody wants to wiki it. But Wendy Williams committed suicide a number of years yeah. ago. That is yeah. unfortunate. Unfortunate. 98 or 99, like around that time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah I wanted to say this year was some some anniversary of, of that. If you, 20 years or You don't whatever. celebrate anniversaries of that. I think she ended up in Arizona or something, right? Was that the deal in a house full of cats or something? Um, I, I, think I don't it was know. Something. Here, let yeah. me, let me, you guys chat amongst yourself and let me see what I can wiki here. Cool. So I really like an I Love Sex where uh, it explodes into that classic Gene riffing, wow, 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 nah, nah, you know, kind of like uh, only you, if you will. That, I think the production works there. You know, um, the double bass drumming on this record appears in atypical places and is played a little differently than your basic metal uh, double bass drumming. And, and I kind of like that there in I Love Sex. And it also happens in the pre-chorus of C minor, opus C minor 7. I think I All said right, that. So here, here's, here's what it says. And I, I, I did not realize this. She first attempted suicide in 1993 by hammering a knife into her chest where it lodged in her sternum. Holy shit. Oh, However, she changed her mind and called Rod and Swenson to take her to the hospital. She attempted suicide again in 97 with an overdose of of hedron. She died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound on April 6, 98, when she was 48. Swenson, her partner for more than 20 years, returned to their home in an area where they had lived since moving to Connecticut from New York City. He found a package that she left him with some special noodles he liked, a packet of seeds for growing garden greens, some oriental massage balm, and sealed letters from her. Uh, The suicide letters included a living will, denying life support, a love letter to Swenson, and various lists of things to do caused Swenson to begin searching the woods for her. After After about an hour, as dusk began, he found her body in a wooded area with a pistol lying on the ground nearby. Wendy's act was not an irrational in the moment act, he said. For four years, she had contemplated suicide. Swanson reportedly described her as despondent at the time of her death. This is what she is said to have written in a suicide note regarding her decision. Um, It just goes on to talk about that. So I didn't realize she attempted a couple other times. You know, I didn't know that. That's called living with depression. Hammering a knife into your sternum. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's pretty. That's tough. brutal. That's that is nasty. So, well, you know, and, yeah, wow, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, we don't want to end it on a downer note, but I think <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning that because, you know, yeah. it is a phenomenal album. But yeah, she obviously was battling demons. Well, well, I, I love that record. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing black electrical tape on my nipples <laughs> under my shirt right now. As we don't is want Mark. I, no, Mark's got blocked electrical tape, but I don't want to tell you where he's put it. Boy. Boy. Ties to Frank under the beans. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It, you know what? I mean, I will say that as for as good as this was, it's sad that we didn't get a, an attempted follow-up album with yeah. this whole yeah. group involved in it again. Because it, well, really, it really worked. Commander of Chaos came after that, right, Mark? Yes. 
And that album, if you're looking for more wow, you're not going to find it. Um, except for a live version of Ain't None of Your Business, which I believe is on that album. Um, it's She went in a heavier direction. She was going more toward... Uh, a metal, uh, if not punk, but it was kind of veering back almost, maybe you would say, toward more of a motorhead type thing. This album just now, there's all right. Before, if any, if anybody, I don't even know if this because I don't have Spotify or anything like that. This record, if you don't know anything about it, there's a I think there's a wiki Mark, thing. On Mark, this, Mark, there's people that listen and don't see, see what you're holding up. So say anyway, what it is. Wendy O. Williams, Maggots, the record. Now, what it is. Wendy was very into the whole environmental thing, and she took it to the yeah. own degree when she did the maggots. It was it's basically the story of you know a world gone crazy, and there's there's like acting in between the songs, but the songs are so fucking super. It's, is heavy. it her her elder album? No, no, no. This is this is like punky. Good metal. question. <laughs> punk metal. Now hold on, because there's a little bit more here. Because again, like I said, um, Maggots the record is really fucking awesome. But again, there's little snippets between each song that tells a story. If you can, and it's really, it's almost like watching. Uh, or the, you listen to just that, um, to the skits. It's very much like a like you're watching or listening to a version of the Twilight Zone. It's, it's well done, but it's very Twilight Zone ish. And then the songs come on. It's funny because I put it on my on my iPod without that, just because I want to just hear the music. But it is a cool listen. Now, here's the crazy thing. And I don't know if you guys know this. After this, Wendy did a rap album. Never knew no, that. No, never knew that. Horrible. Now, when you say horrible, is it like kitschy? Like maybe Dee Dee Ramone's <laughs> rap album? Or... <laughs> It makes the Dee Dee Ramon stuff sound good. And if you've ever heard that, it's that's like unlistenable. Oh, so here's what it says in the wiki. In 1988, Wendy put out another solo album, this time a thrash rap album called Deafest and Baddest. It's I got to hear that. Under the name Ultrafly and the Hometown Girls. Horrid. Horrid. Oh. Put it this way, I don't even own it. Is that, wow. is that, her, is that her Peter Chris one for all? <laughs> you know what? Locked in a room, I'd rather listen to one for all. Holy yeah. crap! Wow. I, that's probably the only record. Well, that, and I'd rather listen to one for one for all than any poison record. But other than that, wow, <laughs> wow, wow, that's like one fell swoop. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> one for all is uh, unlistenable. Look, look, a mistake. Don't, Just don't a mistake. Say don't say it because you're yeah. you're going to be banned for life. <laughs> listen, I got to tell you, you know what? I'm a, I'm a massive Peter Chris fan. Um, and, and I would just say that, you know, producers have a role, you know? And, and I, I think with a strong producer, I think the single, um, there's nothing better than this or better than this is nothing or whatever it's called. I think it could have been a really good track. I think it needed the tweaking of a, of a pro producer. And Peter admitted even is. Yeah, he said that recently, right? That I was coming out and, and yeah. saying that. Or? That re look, that record's just bad. It, it's like you can't even get through all for one or whatever. It, I feel sorry for the guy. I mean, he doesn't know what he's doing. It was just bad. Yeah. yeah. I think. Uh, all right. So, uh, uh, asshole versus one for all versus that was a great record. I love that record. Versus white tiger. Where would you oh, asshole rank? number one? Uh, asshole. asshole. Good record. Number Asshole. one, yeah, is the best. Yeah, yeah, by far. Okay. Then White Tiger, then One yeah. for All. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The White White White, White, White Tiger had terrible it's production. Terrible. It, yeah, it was it, a real it, rough sounding. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it needed a good producer. It needed good production at that time. Hold on one second. The lovely account that is here. You are guys you, talk. Are you, are you, are you getting, <laughs> hi. <laughs> what's, for, what's for dinner? How you doing? <laughs> what's for dinner? If uh we're doing what, what is i'm it? just thinking maybe if brett michaels produced one for all it would have been better i don't know oh boy look at the time hold on a second what is mark's what is all it? blurry mike mark can you wipe all the vaseline off of your um <laughs> lens? <laughs> <laughs> thank you that was good yeah. uh, <laughs> just want to know how much longer because we're gonna go did you no i don't care I just about three or four hours 
Yeah. I'll go read a book. <laughs> are we going out? Or are we? Emily's out with Sarah, so I thought. She was... God, dinner plans. How do you guys feel about out of control? I like it. I'll be up in uh, here. No, yeah. Mike. It was one of those where it's like I bought it, I listened to it, I'm like, uh, it it missed the mark. Just... By myself. Uh, right, what's the ballad? The what's that? What's the ballad at the end of it, Tom? I, I the, liked um... his second solo album much better. Yeah, a lot. I think most kids. Yeah, Let me rock do. you was good. Let me yeah, rock you had first... more had a, had a better. Felt like a better solid album. It was a little more rock feel to it. I love the first one. Yeah, I'm a big out of control guy only because I think it's more personal. I think. No, I mean me... the 78. Oh, God. Oh, 78. Yeah. 78 is. Oh, I love it. It's wonderful. Hold on. The, I will. Look, I'm going to go on record. The, the 78 Peter Chris album is no is, is not as bad as everyone thinks it is. It's actually got some pretty good stuff it's on it. It's actually worse. Performing. Really good. Right. Um, I will tell you, out of control. I'd say pretty much the same thing. And I will tell you, had record companies had a half a brain, By Myself could have been a big hit. I really totally. believe so. So yeah. that song has yeah. got hit single written. I tell you what, if you if, if if someone in Nashville wants a guaranteed hit, and they should, I, I could imagine somebody covering that song. It's a beautiful song. By like Myself a country was a song. Great, it's it was coming a great from the single. expert sitting in his basement, people. Yes, and and the other expert in his basement is going to say that um, that for 1980 that was a perfect American U.S. chart single. Uh, when you look at the charts in '80, it was like post disco, pre MTV, and you had guys like Ronnie Millsap having hits and all these mellow songs. By myself, fit in they, perfectly. They should have pushed it. They should have done that. They yeah. had, that song had hit written all over it. Yeah. Well, if feel only, like letting go. That's, that's the one. one that, yeah, that could work too. The vocals are amazing on that. Yeah. I well, mean, you can knock the guy for a lot of stuff, but I, I seventy eight and the next two are, are pretty good. I mean, they yeah. Don't suck. Yeah. And I yeah. tell you what, singing wise, I, I can't stop the rain. I mean, fuck that vocal's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think Easy Thing uh, is one, one, of vocal. Yeah. one of the best. Yeah, one of the best lead vocals in all of history, hands down. Mm -hmm. I you um, know still in my top five best Kiss songs ever is Dirty Living. That's yeah. Really Dirty Living is interesting because it's kind of cooler than Kiss in a sense. It's a very world class production. Uh, the vocals, the bass. I like Kiss is you know. playing throughout because if you notice, there's not really a. Set. He's playing right. licks throughout the whole thing, and, it's and you know what? Yes. And if you listen to those little ace licks. Uh, it gets even cooler on the extended version because you start to hear even more toward the end than the fade out. Yeah, that's a good track. That's a really strong set. Very Stonesy. Very Stones. Have you ever heard the, the original demo? Yes. It, yes. It's, 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 funny. it's very. Uh, you can't even say it's a. It's a. It's a sketch. It just doesn't have a lot going on for it. Uh, in it, I think there's nothing better. Was a better demo. And I think that's a great track as well on Out of Control. Mm -hmm. Very Huey Lewis before Huey Lewis was Huey Lewis in the news. Yeah. yeah. that's a, I mean, I'd, I'd never thought of it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It is very kind of Huey Lewis-ish. I love Huey Lewis. He's awesome. Oh, yeah. Well, I was, I was telling Tommy, we, I went, not, not as a goof, but we have a, a, a nice theater near us, probably within the last 10 years or whatever. It was one of those nice summer nights, and Liz and I are like, just, he's playing up there. Why don't just go? You know, we yeah. have nothing going on. Because they have they have this really nice like buffet and drink. They were like, I will go out and sit outside. It was a gorgeous summer night. Music and food. What's better for Mark? Sure. Oh, you can eat crab. You're there, it was brother. One of those shows where we just go. We'd watch maybe the first five songs and go. This really isn't for us. Stayed to the end. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Huey Lewis you're talking about, Mark. Yeah. You know. Um, People, if they like Huey Lewis, they should probably check out Clover, which was his band yep. beforehand. Clover has great stuff. And Huey Lewis is another thing, um, like your Poison, where they have a lot of hits. Not my Poison, Ron. Not my Poison. <laughs> I was just trying to slip that in there. <laughs> That's oh, what she speaking said. of slipping, you know what? I, Mike, I had told you um, that if you like, I can offer an announcement here on your show. Okay. I am officially going to be putting out a book about Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. 
You were working on that for yes. like yes. 40 years. Nice. <laughs> and this is uh, taking longer than Haley's Comet and Freely's Comet. Uh, but <laughs> what happened was, Mike, and, and Mike will remember uh, – when we did a profile thing on Kiss Online years ago and everything, I wanted to write a book about it and do a big book um, just covering the, the film in, in, in from soup to nuts, you know, as a pop culture thing, as a Kiss thing, of course. Um, and I, I kind of started my, my entertainment business and I, you know, I had kids and I just kind of lost interest in it and, and tabled it. Uh, recently, I found the cassettes, you know, in the basement here. Uh, the cassettes are on the pinball machine right there. That's the, nice. the cassettes. And I and you know what? This time I just didn't shuffle them or move them on my way to something else. I said, you know what? I want to do something with that. So I got in touch with a, um, a book publisher and I said, at the very least, I just want to transcribe the interviews and, and put them out there because I interviewed over 16 people uh, from all sides of the production, from, from the KISS side uh, to directors to on-screen people. And I said again let me just put out at least the interview so you know it won't be the definitive document on the book but conversations with phantoms interviews about kiss meets the phantom of the park will be a great add-on to anybody that likes that tv movie what what's your timeline totally for agree. for releasing it timeline mike i'm looking at um the year 2525 no actually, <laughs> uh, it's it's about i would say within 12 months okay it'll that's be awesome out. i've been chugging along on it um, I, I think it's pretty cool because it's, first of all, it's odd to go back and listen to yourself, uh, 17 years ago doing interviews, you know? Yes. But, uh, these were, these interviews were the first time that anybody connected to the project spoke about it. And you hear their surprise at why somebody would be writing such a book mm -hmm. and you hear their marvel at remembering it fondly. Uh, so I, I think it'll definitely be, uh, Worthwhile for Kiss fans do you, and 70s pop culture fans. Do you talk to any of the stunt doubles? I spoke to, yes, absolutely. Black um, Ace? I did not talk to um, that guy yet. Um, I spoke with uh, a gentleman named Don Lewis, who did some commentary for the Kissology series. I actually worked on that uh, when Attack of the Phantoms came out on that. Um, I hooked uh, everybody up with Don Lewis and a couple other people connected to it at the time. And, and he was great. And uh, I, there are a lot of stories. There, there's a lot of things. I, I, I'm looking forward to having it done and just being out there. Well, that's good. That's, Did you that's talk awesome. to Anthony Zerb? Anthony Zerbe, I could not get at the time. And it's funny because I'm on he a trail. He doesn't want to talk him. about it. Well, no, you know what? Actually, you know what? He just declined politely. Exactly. I was yeah. going back and forth with his agents. But let me tell you who I did speak to. Um, I had a lengthy conversation with Gordon Hessler, uh, who has now since passed, of course. Yeah. Uh, Deke Hayward, who actually passed away a, a month after. Um, so I, I've gotten the last interviews uh, on the topic with a lot of people involved and, and things like that. And then there's just, you know, riotous interviews with people like Lisa Persky, who played Dirty D. And, and um, there's a good balance overall. And you really get an, a good picture of this little TV movie that we all, you know, have so, elevated. Well, let, let, me, let me ask you, as a Kiss fan, is there one little tidbit you could share with us that you that you heard from them that you were like, oh, that's so fucking cool or funny that the, we never knew thing, about? The one thing I just came across, and I don't think this has come out in the years since, uh, but what it was is I was listening to the cassette. I couldn't believe it. It's the fact that – bad connection. I'm sorry. I, I Did you guys hear that? I, the connection was bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good, Mike. It's good. I, and it is a number one fact. It is. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a really cool thing that I don't think is out there, and it really blew my mind. So uh, it, it was awesome. Yeah. That's okay. cool. I, I'm, I, I, That's I'm glad to see that you're finally getting that out there because, again, I remember you talking about that on the AOL boards. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> I went out there so naive. You know, I'm going to put together this book. No AOL problem. Boards. Flew out to California a couple times, interviewed people and uh, was on a trail of some photos. And then the trail went cold and, you know, all these things. Um, and now I just kind of want to reclaim it. And, and the work I've done, I, I just want to get out there to share with everybody. Cool. That, that's that's awesome. really the goal here. Yeah. Very cool. So, like so, so let me ask you, Ron, if people want to 
follow you or stay up to date with what's going on, where can they find you online? There is a Conversations with Phantoms Facebook page I've set up. And uh, just like that page, and as things develop, I'm going to start uh, putting updates on there and, and other information as well. Conversations with Phantoms. Yes. That's an awesome title. Yeah, I'm pretty psyched about it, I have to say. Uh, it's weird to work on something so much in your life uh, and then just put it aside. I don't know if you guys know, I'm, I'm a children's entertainer, uh, and I do, no. music, I, I do music for kids and everything. Oh, and cool. Uh, Tommy the, did that for years until, you know, the police got involved. The lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Knew it was coming. I just lobbed it out there to see who would take a swing. And, <laughs> and lo and behold. Uh, so, you, you know, life is what happens, you know, right? Uh, so I kind of did all of it. And then I get emails to this day. Hey, are you that guy? And I'd be like, yeah, I never finished the book. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so, you know, it, it'll be fun. And I'm sure you get the fans are like, you owe it to us to finish this book. Well, I've gotten interrogated. That's for sure. You know, like, why? What? You know, I, I've really, uh, you know, I was like, oh, geez, I'm never announcing anything. Exactly. You know, it's like, again. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. I have a family and a life. <laughs> like when I do my crocus book, I'm not going to say <laughs> I'm right there, man. <laughs> Mark Mark will be waiting in line at your front door to buy it, the release. I'm the guy who's going to buy it. <laughs> Ded time. Dedicate it to my only customer, Mark Cicchini. <laughs> How can you not like the first four Crocus records? You just can't. You gotta love those records. And you know they're actually pretty big in Europe to this day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, go out there right now and and spy whatever you do, Headhunter. That was fucking awesome. Yeah, that 84. One vice at a time. Awesome, awesome record. So, so Mike, do you have a band that you champion that perhaps uh, is not as loved by many, a la Crocus? Um, not, well, I suppose you could say Black and Blue. If you're talking hair metal era, I love Black and Blue. Their, okay. their first album is just phenomenal. Okay. Where love do you it? sit on In Heat? You know, as they moved on, they lost something. And I feel like they were one of those bands who got pulled in different directions by the record label and by producers. You know, I'm not necessarily a big fan of what Gene did with them either. You know, I bought yeah, the albums because Gene was involved, yeah. but I, it, it just felt like, you know, that first album was a raw-sounding rock and roll band. And then the frickin' record labels were like, Hey, we got to turn you to Bon Jovi. And In Heat is mostly like a drum machine, isn't it, too? Yeah, it's a very processed, yeah. kind of odd. One of the best examples of that is Except, when they got to Midnight Mover. Oh, and, God. And, and how do you yeah. compare yeah. to Restless and Wild or Breaker? You, the, know, what the, I mean? you yeah. know, during the 80s, you know, so here's, here's a little Kiss connection, because I used to work with Except. And their manager told me that um, in 87... Glickman Marks for a short time managed Accept. That's right. That's took, right. Took took over managing Accept, and that's yes. when Glickman Marks and the record label were like, "Okay, you guys need to get rid of your lead singer. You need a bl long blonde hair American." Yes. You know, so they went that whole route, which was just like I, I think it was David Reese who came in and just didn't yes, go anywhere. Though. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Glickman yeah. Marks so, tried to pick him up and and work him a little bit. Uh, that single got a little play too. I remember that, but it, yeah, it was ultimately uh, it paled in comparison. It, 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 it just it just, was, it just yeah. paled. I mean, you know, like him or not, Udo is extremely extremely unique. Yeah. Um, and you know, they tried to make them over into a fashion American heavy metal band, and it didn't work. They did the same thing with Raven because all for one that that album's free rules, and then the next thing you know, they're putting them in. Makeup and Tommy's I going. Who are these? Are bands? you talking about when um, what well, Venom did that too, right? I think you're right. I think they did. They, 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 oh, Celtic Frost. They did Celtic that. Frost. Yes. yes, they came out with like they had bullet belts and you know jeans and then Lizzie they came Borden. Out with, like, you know, Lizzie Borden did it. Lizzie Borden did a That's major makeover. They took yes. this whole subgenre of metal and fucking ruined it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, they there's a, you want to talk about great metal. 
the all for one. Not with you. Fuck. <laughs> 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 Well, Tom, do you have a band that's kind of, uh, you know, not really universally loved and you dig them? Garbage. Uh, yeah, them too. But like if you're talking in the metal era, uh, probably um, Faster Pussycat and uh, Cinderella would I be my two. I, I know you do. You know, I'm just busting your balls. Long Cold Winter, I think, is a major classic, not only of the genre, but I just think a great rock and roll record. Yeah, it is. That and the third record, Heartbreak Station, is phenomenal. Sad and Faster Pussycat. Just, huh? Yeah. And it's sad that it didn't do anything. Uh, they probably felt victim to the same type of thing that Cheap Trick fell victim to. Because if you look at the Cinderella's, their first record, that album cover is not representative of who they no. were no. at all. But that's the it only reason hurt. I bought that album was because of no, the album No, I understand. You, they did it. They did go. the right thing. But it's like they, that, they're they so the much more than that. So awesome. on a night song. Guys. Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah. But there's yeah. so much more than that, it's whereas stuff. some bands are just that's all they are. I, I, here's what, here, I tell you what, though, to be fair, and, and the reason I don't like Poison is my ears. I remember when I first they saw suck. pictures of that Master Pussycat, and I'm like, these guys are going to suck. And then I heard them. I'm like. That's great rock and roll. You know, that first, the, the first Faster Pussycat record. First of all, I kind of learned to play drums to that record. That okay. was just an album. Me and my friends, and my friend was a young guitar player, and he learned all the licks on that record. And uh, uh, that, I think that's an unsung classic. I, I, I definitely do. Dude. Yeah. First, the yeah. third one for me is their best, Whipped. Wow. With, with Jack the Bastard and oh, oh, Big Dictionary and, and all that. Yes. I could listen to that album all fucking day. Whipped. Yeah. Whipped, that's the record. Yes, it's, and then the second like, record with Little Dove, I'm like, oh. fantastic. Yes, I, do you have the EP with the uh, with the cover no. with the uh, the EP from it's buckled, belted, and booted or whatever. No, well, I gotta check that out. Oh, I'm gonna go grab it just so you can see. It's Jesus, awesome. he's getting up again. Check that. He's got a, he got a <laughs> like, Holy up crap, he's gonna lose <laughs> ten like, pounds today. I say. <laughs> so no, it's just look. I, I all kidding aside, I just look. I don't I don't dislike any of those bands. It just a lot of that stuff I just don't care for because, you know, I remember seeing an interview with Alice Cooper and, and he said something like, all these bands come to me and they're like, we do this and we do that. And he's like, okay, but where's the song? Yeah. So for me, yeah. when I talk about, when you guys talk about Venom well, and Crocus and all those, I don't hear it. For yeah. me, the vocals are so incredibly important, which is why I love Cheap Tricks so much. So it's very hard for me to go from Robin Zander to Udo. Tommy, do you have that? It's got extra songs from the same session. When, no, that's, when did that come out? Is that it, like it's something? The, it's the no nonstop to nowhere single. Oh, okay. okay. It's like got a maxi single. Single three un, three unreleased songs on. It, no, I have never seen that. Band. Yeah, yeah, I just love that band. They're so good, you know. And so that's I, I like. To me, it's got to. It, the vocals have to be right, and it just yeah. isn't for me with Venom and some of those other bands. And except, I, I don't and, like Venom either, Tom. That's terrible you can't no but ron had mentioned him and i'm just like you know i don't know raven all that i probably stuff. never mentioned venom in my life before that point well, so, but, uh, yeah <laughs> but yeah so for me it's it, it, it for me it's always got to have the hook it's got to be a little yeah. bit poppier like i don't think i don't think of motley Crue as a heavy metal band i view them as a hard rock band just like i do um van halen or kiss they're not heavy metal heavy metal to me is judas priest well that's and why yeah queen's yeah. right and you know Motley Crue, I think, ended up being the story of potential more than anything. A a as great as they are, and I'm a huge Motley fan. I mean, Tommy Lee, I mm. mean, wow. I mean, God, great drummer to this day. Um, but I think they could have been so much more if they, um, you know, it, it, this is off the record. This is off the record, Mike. As somebody described Motley Crue to me as a band with like three Ace Freelys in it once. Uh, oh, meaning my God, that, that would suck. Yeah, well, tough to get everybody on board, and you know what I mean? Like, just oh, it's uh, as dysfunctional as it gets. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's what they meant. And this is before mm -hmm. the rebirth of Ace Freely, mind you, because I am yeah. an Ace Freely historian, as quoted in Blabbermouth last week. So, I oh, nice. Well, there you, you got, yeah, so you got yeah. that going for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I think uh, Motley could have done as much as they did, I think they could have done even more. Oh, but and I don't doubt that. And, and, and the thing is that I get in these. Uh, discussions with these fans who get so pissed at me when I tell them that the, the Motley Crue, even though I loved it and at the time, Motley Crue's first record is, for me, is nowhere near their best record. 
not even in the ballpark, you know. Because I went Motley Crue, first two records. Yeah, I I love, and the one that no new tattoos fucking brilliant. That's amazing. Absolutely, it's absolutely. amazing. Start to well, and finish is incredible, yeah. and. Then Saints from Los, Saints of Los Angeles, perfect. Yeah, it's yes. a record. It's a good record. Yes. So, so, so to me, those yes. are the top four. Yes, yeah. and then and then of course their remake of Shout at the Devil from '97 is that. fucking yeah. awesome. I can't even have that God. record. Fine. There's like yeah. four dynamite songs. There is. Right? Yep. But I was the, just listening to it yesterday. Let and us pray is fucking incredible. Oh, they, they wrote like the best cheap trick song that never was with Afraid. Afraid, That's a yes. Great yeah. tune. Uh, Find Myself is, is brutal. That's one of my Love all-time it. favorites. They're the best Love band to listen song. to in the gym. Like Speaking of that, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, Ron, but I don't want to forget to ask, because I will if I don't ask right now. Mark, do you on video have Motley Crue from 1997 on Japanese television? There was about a 40-minute live pro shot of that tour. I Rock on the Bay, right? Yeah. Does Rock anybody, on the I, Bay, Tommy? Yeah, I need a copy of that. I want to see that because they open up with "Find Myself." Yes, great gig. Yes, oh, amazing. Yeah, Just love you know, I band. saw them a lot uh, when they when Cheap Trick opened for them because mm-hmm. that's when I had started doing the fanzine. And yep. uh, what a double bill! I walked I, out of that show. It's you the did? Only that I've ever walked out of. I thought Motley Crue was horrible. I thought they were really? terrible. I'll never forget they went into I don't know if it was Glitter or Brandon or something. It just seemed to go on for twenty minutes, and I'm like. All right, I already saw Cheap Trick play. I don't know who the fuck these clumps think they are. I'm out here. <laughs> they're I, not, honestly, they're not throwing meat at me, so I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've literally seen thousand plus concerts in my. I don't. I. I think I'm trying to think that. Oh, I walked. I walked out of two. I walked. That was one of them. I walked out. Of. I walked out of a Kiss concert. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Nineteen. No, not nineteen. Two thousand. Two thousand. Seven. It was is, up at yeah. it was their hit and run tour here in California, like four dates. They played Clear Lake, Canocti Harbor. I saw them, I saw them here at Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, yeah, I remember. That. I took yeah. Katrina to it. We were still dating, and at the end of the main set, I looked at her and said, "Let's go." I go. I, I I'd rather beat traffic than watch the end of the Kiss show, because yeah. it was so. So it, they, this is when they were still just so scripted. Everything was like what they've been doing for the last 10 years on the road. Same set right. list, right. same stage show, same rap, same everything. I'm just like, fuck this. I don't need to stay for three more songs. I know exactly what Paul's going to say. I know exactly what effects they're going to do. <laughs> I know what the songs are going to be. I'd yeah. rather be trafficked than watch Kiss. And, you know, yeah. and, and I do remember going, that's a first for me. Because before that... I would stay at a KISS show until the house lights were up and security guards were going, you got to leave, you got to leave, you got to leave. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think when you look at Latter Day KISS, you realize what a rebirth Sonic Boom was in many ways. Um, The the gigs in that era, I mean, first of all, I mean, Eric Singer, whatever they were paying him on that tour, they should have doubled it because that guy was hustling back there on that kit and, and, and singing so much. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Sonic over Europe, baby, it was awesome. And I, I, I gotta say, you know, and and you know, Kiss is a thing, you know. As you guys, I'm sure, it really is sports talk. You know, it's maybe you like the '78 Yankees, but I thought they were great. You know, ten years ago, and mm-hmm. everybody has their team, their era. You know, yeah. that you gravitate to. So it could get, uh, you can get into muddy waters there. But, um, you know, I, I think Sonic Boom really. Uh, I think they really reconnected with what they have. And, and I think that's when this lineup developed something of a chemistry. I think. I, I mean, that, that's what I would say. You know what I mean? I, I'm sure. Well, you know, I, I, can, great, but... I can tell you from because I worked with them up through 2000, 2005. About 2003, right? Or something? No, no, I forget. It's like 2000, 2005 or six or something like that. Yeah, there was yeah. a you know there was a lot of it felt like to me and I'm, this is just my opinion, they didn't know why they were touring. They just knew they had to tour every year, so there was no focus. Right. There was no reason right. for anything. Sonic yeah. Boom came along and it focused them 
on what they needed Something. to do. We're focused yeah. on Sonic Boom. We've got we've got a a slightly new stage. We've got new costumes. We've got all yes. you know. It was like yes. okay, because right. literally from the farewell tour up to Sonic Boom, it was the same stage, stacked yeah, I, amps. Maybe they had video screens on the amps, but yeah. it was still stacked amps. Everything was the same. Every tour, it was the same set list, except for Rock the Nation. I'll give you that. Rock the Nation, they really right. changed it up. But that didn't seem to reignite things in ticket buying. It reignited the diehards, but the diehards were going anyway. We loved it. But after that, it was like no, nobody give a crap that they pulled out this one rarity on this one song. You know, it's, yeah. Kiss is a type of band that needs a, a purpose. Mm -hmm. They're not a cheap trick. Cheap trick will go out. Their purpose is to play, They'll, and that's it. Rick Nielsen is a guy, I mean, you just wind him up and he goes. He, he's he's a guy that, you know, will just play forever. They're also a, a band that can change their set list every freaking right. night. No problem. And they right. do. So, and they do. they do. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when you look at Kiss, though, it's a different uh, animal, you know, the best way to see that between Sonic Boom and beforehand, Mike, is when you look at, I believe, the Japan footage from 2004, uh, 2005, maybe around there. And they just seem very autopilot -y. Um, You know, something needed to happen yep. uh, for this to continue. And I'm glad there's a kiss because I got to take my kids and like you have, Mike. You know, so am I. I'm 100% yeah. glad. You know, I'm yeah. glad yeah. they've gotten back and they've recharged me because... You know, yeah. again, from that, when I walked out of that show, I didn't go see a KISS concert for seven years, from 2007 to 2014. Right. Prior to that, I went to every KISS show from Creatures of the Night Tour up to 2007. Every KISS show I could go to, if they came to my town, I went to them. I drove to yep. other. Yep. It didn't matter. And I finally, at 2007, said, Fuck this! I can't keep going to yeah. the same shit. You, you guys, you're, like, you're not, you're not changing yeah. it. You're like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, wa know? I'm watching the yeah. reruns. Is what I'm watching. I want a new season of this, this series. Yeah. And I, you know what? Alice Go Cooper, ahead. hair metal era. I just, I had enough. I, I was going to ask you that, Mark. What do you think of Constrictor and 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 I Rage Fist and the, the, the tours were good. I liked. I actually liked Rage Your Fist a lot too. Uh, yeah. Do I like the record? No, it's uh, horribly produced. I yes. Like the drums, yeah. the whole, it's very soulless. And I really, yeah. I'm not crazy about it. It's just okay, I guess. Uh, yeah. I, the tour was great. And obviously, you know, that was made into a DVD from the Detroit shows. I went to. Yes. Oh, awesome. Yep. Um, but when, when I, you know, Hey Stupid, I, I just can't even stomach. And, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Again, I call it Hair Metal Isle. It's the whole Poison, you know, song. I, it's, I just, it's just so not. Alice to me, so. But boy, oh boy, much like uh, Creek of the Night when he hit Brutal Planet, Mark was back on board. So uh, it's a big record for fans. Oh, Fan, fans like that album a lot. I, I, I gotta go. It's seven thirty here. I got my wife waiting up, upstairs. And, you know, Ron, you're witnessing it. Food comes first. It does. <laughs> it's seven thirty, guys. My day started at five thirty a.m. So I am, I am uh, yes. <laughs> you know, it drove halfway across the state today. You know, Mark, we could always get another co-host. Well, I know one you could get <laughs> right now. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, so Ron, Lisa, the weather girl. Ron, you want to start the real show and get these guys, these two losers? So <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll wrap up with Ron now so Mark can go, go, no, go I, eat. This guy got Liz waiting upstairs. And mm -hmm. It's 7.30. I, I got a. We keep. Going. Look, I could. I would love to sit and talk for another fucking half hour, but then it's gonna be eight o'clock. Uh, All right, wait one second. Zipper catches skin. Do you like it? Oh, love it. Are you kidding? Yeah. Me? Oh, great record. Yes. yes. That was great. You know, I saw the Special Forces tour as well. Oh man. Uh, the Joe Perry project and Spider with Anton Fig playing drums opened the show. That's crazy. That's that's it's absolutely crazy. crazy. See what I mean? We're gonna just keep fucking going. I'm hungry. We gotta go. My wife's waiting. I'm hungry. That, that's it. Don't get in the way of Mark when he says I'm hungry. Gonna keep your fingers away from his mouth. Exactly. Ron, this was awesome. You're, was. You, you've, you've got it an was. open invite to come back, especially when, when you, you want to come you. in and plug your book as it gets closer. Let us know. Yeah, let sure. us know what happens Thanks, with guys. that. We're curious. 
this is just great to come inside the machine and, and see this, how you this, guys this operate. Is, this is just it. We <laughs> it's earlier, Scott, he got arrested. <laughs> see how you guys bicker. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you, you see there's nothing fancy to this shit. We just sit here and gab is all we do. Mm-hmm. That's all it is, man. But it's awesome, man. You built up something wonderful. It's, it's Thank you. you know, strong arm our way. We yeah, we strong armed our way to this. It took us five years, but we muscled our way up to the top. We, we did yeah. four million views, but that's with like twelve people. We have a little industry of twelve people. Same twelve people. Play, <laughs> I, I fucking pay these twelve people so much money to keep hitting the play button. You need yeah, Chinese click, an hour. click yeah. Chinese <laughs> click farms. That's what we live off of. All right, Ron, this was awesome. Thank, Thank you, you guys. So much, man. Thank you very much. Thanks, right. Ron. Take Bye, care. Man. We'll see ya. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. It's almost as if Mark doesn't exist because he's gone already. I know. It's crazy. But you know that's the that's the deal when you work with Mark Chikini. When yeah, food the gets bell to, rings. when the dinner bell rings, he's gone. Mm-hmm. That There's was a, that was a freaking awesome conversation. So freaking awesome. You know, sitting around with Ron who I knew was a diehard Kiss fan right there in the early days of Kiss when they were online and uh when he said, "Listen, I'd love I there was one episode where we talked about wow and he said I'd love to come on and talk about it." I said, let's do it. Well, and, and to me, this episode takes me right back to the last episode we did when Ryan was on, that it's just KISS fans sitting around and talking. Yeah. That's what this show is all about. Yep. Yep. You know, we t- we tried to keep it focused on, on, on Wendy O, but clearly we had a lot of really great Cheap Trick conversations. I mean, there's just a lot of good music discussed this week, so... Yeah. You know, from, we're always going to bring you kiss. We're always going to bring you kiss oriented guests when we do have guests on. We're not going to I mean, we're not going to interview the guy who was serving hot dogs on tier two at uh, the St. Paul Civic Center. Well, unless but, he served a hot dog to Paul Stanley. Maybe. I don't know. Do you, I just, mean, if, you somebody, know. if somebody knows the guy who sold a hot dog to Paul Stanley, let us know. Cause I'll, right. him, I'll put him on the show. It is my show. No. <laughs> Apparently, I make all the decisions. <laughs> exactly, I'm the I'm the Godfather. All right, okay, so Mike, we'll do what you want. Home, home, homework for this week related to the Wendy O. Williams album. First of all, how many of you have heard this? If you've heard it, what do you think? I don't want to. It's great. It sucks. Give us a good answer. Yeah. And uh, what what tracks, you know, track by track. We went through a track by track, told you what we thought. You go through a track by track. Tell us what you thought. Mm-hmm. Were you were you around when this came out? What did how did you feel when this came out in 1984? Or if you're a new fan and just discovered it, what do you think of it? Yeah, cuz it's like Ron was saying it's available on Spotify at the very least. It, you got to dig a little bit, but You got you got to dig, you can find it, but it's worth the listen. Kid you not, it is the best KISS record without a KISS logo on it. Mm-hmm. It's true. So, yeah, we want to hear your feedback. Let us know what you think of the record. Yeah, please, 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 please. So head over to Facebook.com slash Three Sides of the Coin. Head over to Three Sides of the Coin.com, Spreaker, YouTube, everywhere else you can find us. Leave your homework answers, and we will see you next week. Three Sides, we're out. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Take Three Sides of the Coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. 
go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.